A touch of caution to start the year. Live from Studio 2 here at Bloomberg headquarters in New York. Welcome to 2024. I'm Romaine Bostic. And I'm Katie Greifeld. We're kicking off to the closing bell here in the U.S. And uh, not exactly starting with a bang here. You take a look at the S&P 500 off by about six tenths of a percent. But you think about how we finished 2023 and maybe makes sense to take a little bit of a breather here. Maybe a little bit more of a breather when it comes to big tech. Of course, you see the Nasdaq 100 off by about 1.8 percent. That's after the index added 55 percent in 2023 alone. So starting 2024, a little bit on the back foot, of course, as bonds start to march higher, at least when it comes to yields. You take a look at the 10 year right now, currently up about seven basis points, still below that 4% level, but of course getting closer. And at the same time, you're seeing a little bit of a haven bid come into the dollar. The Bloomberg dollar index currently up by about seven tenths of a percent Romaine. Uh, that's after what we know was not a very pretty 2023. Yeah, kind of hard to wrap our heads around some of the price action today, whether it's driven by fundamentals, technicals or something in between. But let's take a look at some of the most notable movers. The biggest one out there is Apple. Roughly 53 analysts covering this company. And while the vast majority have buy ratings on the stock, more and more are starting to lower their expectation for the quarters ahead. Barclays analysts cutting their recommendation to underweight, that's a sell equivalent, on data that they say shows waning demand for new iPhone models. That downgrade taking the stock's recommendation consensus, which is basically the proxy for all the ratios of buy, hold, and sell ratings, that's now down to 4.08 out of 5, the lowest level we've seen on that consensus recommendation going back to late 2020. Apple, the second biggest weighting in the S&P 500 today, the biggest point drag on the index also today as well. Not much help from the other six of the magnificent seven stocks either. NVIDIA, Amazon, Meta, Microsoft, each down at least 2% or more on an intraday basis. Tesla oscillating between gains and losses. This after it reported those fourth quarter car delivery numbers that were maybe a touch short of Wall Street's loftiest expectations. A lot of concern out there about waning interest for electric vehicles. Rivian also out with its quarterly numbers, numbers that missed analyst expectations, numbers that marked a sequential decline in deliveries from the third quarter. Those are two things we're going to talk about today, but today's price setbacks, at least for now, are just one day of course correction. Not enough to shake the faith in most Wall Street analysts out there, Katie, who came into this year saying 2024 would actually finish out better than 2023. And they're still bullish, probably because they were beaten into submission when it comes to 2023. Behind me, of course, you're looking at the Magnificent Seven in white, adding nearly $5 trillion of market cap last year alone. You compare that, of course, to the S&P 500 itself, adding about $3.1 trillion. A lot of those gains for 2023 coming from big tech, even though it's sort of petered out when it comes to the tail end of 2023. You can see the S&P 500 alone as that rally broadened, really adding a lot of heft there. And a lot of that comes down to the Fed outlook. You take a look, what is price from the Federal Reserve in 2024? We're talking six rate cuts, Romaine. Of course, 146 basis points of cuts priced in right now. That's adding to a lot of euphoria, basically, that we're at the end of the tightening cycle and we're going to get some relief from those higher interest rates starting this year. It remains to be seen. Uh, how that calculus stands up. Of course, we haven't heard from uh, the Fed speakers in a little bit, but that's the setup as we start this first trading day of 2024. Let's get some insights out of an old friend of this show, Barry Bannister, joining us right now to kick us off to the close. Stiefel's chief equity strategist here on the first trading day of 2024. Uh, Barry, I, again, we came into this year with expectations kind of shifting to a much more positive tone relative to where it was, I think, earlier in 2023 here. Is there a reason to maybe shift that tone, that sentiment, maybe back a little bit more to the defensive side? I wouldn't say defensive per se, even though there's a little bit of a pop today. I think that the lagging cyclical value groups, if you believe the economy can hold on, uh, we're due for a bounce. So this would include banks, financials, uh, some energy, some industrial, some basic material, and a few of the real estate and um, Transpo names. This However, the the cyclical growth, the big tech, was just simply overvalued versus financial conditions and versus the ten year yield outlook that we have. So I am curious. So I mean, we we saw kind of that cyclical outperformance in the last uh, few weeks, last couple of months of the year, and that's even playing out today, even though everything's in the red. I, I am curious, though, whether the economic picture is going to support uh, a continuation of that trade going forward. 
Oh, there, you know, there are a lot of cross currents overseas that are really more interesting than even what's going on in the U.S. China is doing some stimulus, some policy stimulus, and they would benefit from the Fed simply stopping. Europe's central banks and the U.K. as well uh, are say they're plowing ahead, even though there is a weakening of inflation there. So they are almost making a mistake, I would say. Um, and so if you don't get any overseas recovery, if the dollar were to strengthen, that would be very bad for the cyclical value trade. Uh, but that's not our view. We think the world economy will gradually pick up in 24, and that would take some of the wind out of the sails of the dollar. It would give a good lift to the uh, cyclical value trade I, I, I laid out. And I want to talk a little bit about what's priced in when it comes to the Fed, because the 2024 outlook, at least looking at the bond market, seems pretty aggressive. Six rate cuts. What would possibly justify that when it comes to the economic backdrop? And if that does materialize, what would that mean for equities? Well, unless the economy weakens and, and is going to weaken in a prospective timeline, uh, there's really no reason for six rate cuts. Uh, that would uninvert the 10-year, three-month curve. Um, I think that uh, the Fed wants to keep its um, options open, and they'll continue to talk about three cuts until you know, there's clarity that inflation truly is coming down to their target. You see Wall Street uh, waltzing out the three- and six-month annualized rate of change, uh, but that's a very volatile series. And actually, our model shows that it would pick up in the first half of 24 and upend some of those optimists that inflation would just crater back down to sub two. So if uh, if the Fed is going to hold its options out for the first half, so are we. Uh, I don't want to be too bulled up on uh, on betting on the Fed cutting rates. All right. It's always important to have options. Respect you keeping your options open. So let's talk a little bit, though, about the relationship between the bond market and the stock market. Of course, you take a look at how 10-year yields behaved in 2023, and it was just a roller coaster that didn't seem to bleed through into equity volatility. But entering into 2024, 10 year yield sitting right below 4% or so. How are you thinking about the dynamic between those two asset classes? You know, this is where a little history is actually interesting because we're doing uh, something we did in the past, but directly opposite what happened then. If you think back to um, 2020 to present, it's really been a rotation from borderline deflation to some reflation. In the same way, uh, 1980 was a massive uh, redirection from more than a decade of inflation to actual disinflation. The bond market did not figure that out. The 10-year yield was over 10 percent, and the real yield was over 5 percent on average the first half of the 80s, and yet inflation peaked in April 1980. So it takes a while, I think, for the market to realize that the 10-year shouldn't be below 4 percent. It shouldn't be much below nominal potential GDP of the United States. And if you take a real tips yield of 1.5 and add $80 equivalent oil or 2.5 percent on break-even inflation, that's an inductive way to get to a 4 percent yield floor. Absent a recession, if you're not going to go below 4, multiples are a little high, particularly for growth stocks. That could be what we're seeing today. All right, Barry, always great to catch up with you, particularly here on the first day of the year. What a way to start with Barry Bannister over at Stiefel, kicking us off to the close here on this Tuesday afternoon. Coming up, a lot to cover on the show, including a look at the U.S. economy and the big question as to whether it's headed for a recession or a soft landing. Rob Sock and Global Economist over at City joining us in just a second. Plus, we'll get the latest on the tensions in the Red Sea as Iran sends a warship to challenge U.S. forces in the key trade route. And Carrier Global closing its acquisition of Weissman and preparing to close that divestiture here over to Honeywell. David Gitlin, the chairman and CEO of Carrier, he'll be joining us a little bit later this hour. Stick around. All that and more coming up in a bit on The Close. This is Bloomberg. We have several key economic events to look out for this week, including Fed Minutes tomorrow and the U.S. jobs report 
coming on Friday. Here to walk us through the expectations is Bloomberg's Abigail Doolittle. Indeed, Katie. A new week, a new year, new economic data. And of course, this morning we had the final reading for the December U.S. PMIs on a manufacturing level, still in a contraction at 47.9. And that really is uh, a foretelling in some ways for the ISM manufacturing due out tomorrow. Uh, the number is likely to come in. The estimate, the survey is at 47.2. That would be up if it comes in at that level from uh, November at 46.7, but it's still a contraction. So we have a recession in U.S manufacturing. Jolts is expected to show roughly uh, nearly 9 million uh, job openings, uh, basically holding steady. And then you were mentioning those FOMC minutes. I think people will really be scouring them to see whether or not there's any clues on the timing or the amount of cuts. Will those dot plots, uh, will suggest anything about the dot plot uh, changing. As for jobs on Friday, well, it is, of course, the month of December, and we have a very interesting look at the last few Decembers. So the number, the estimate for December is 171,000 uh, jobs were added versus November of 199,000. So a slight downtick, but basically right there uh, in line. Last year, nearly uh, 240,000 jobs were added. Take a look at December 21 relative to December 20. Uh, it's really interesting to see the pandemic. And I, to my memory, it's hard. it doesn't, didn't feel like the big job declines were still happening in December of 2020, but they were. We saw the big bounce back. But the December number that we're looking for this Friday, essentially in line if you were to make a median of this. And then finally, if we put this together, the U.S. with the world, because I was talking about that recession for manufacturing, it's not just the U.S. Take a look at this. We're looking at the PMIs for the Eurozone, France, Germany, uh, the U.K. Uh, PMI. All of them remain below 50. Above 50, of course, would suggest 0.2 uh, expansion. Below 50 is a contraction. So it's so interesting that everybody's talking about the idea of a soft landing, and yet we have the manufacturing sector uh, still having a bit of a tough time having any kind of landing at all. Yeah, I've been mired in that for a while. The big question is, does it pull out of that, or maybe is there something else that counteracts it? Rob Sockin joining us right now, City Global Economist, uh, to talk a little bit more about economic conditions. And we're coming off a quarter here in the U.S. at least, where we saw, what, 4.9% mm -hmm. uh, growth on GDP. And even the global numbers, when you aggregate them all together, we're still around like 3% growth. That's for 2023, of course. The big question is, should we expect those numbers to soften materially this year? Yeah, and that's, and that's the key question. And admittedly, 2023 was a much stronger than, year than we expected. As you mentioned, not just for the U.S., but globally. And I think if we look back, what we really kind of missed is, A, how long it would take those um, interest rate hikes to really play through the system, and B, the strength of services demand post-pandemic was just a lot more durable than we anticipated. Um, but we think going into 2024, those interest rate hikes are going to start to bite more, um, and um, that services uh, tailwind that really powered growth in 2023 is going to start to fade uh, even further. I felt like a month or so ago, at least on this show, not with you, there were a lot of people talking about sticking that soft landing, particularly coming out of that last Fed meeting yes. uh, where they basically signaled those rate cuts, more rate cuts than I think what they had ever signaled before here. Do you not buy into the idea that a soft landing is plausible? I think uh, we're still in the recession camp and there are a couple elements I would point to that make us think that a recession is still likely. One being uh, the amount of uh, tightening credit conditions that we've seen. You're still seeing pretty significant tightening and that takes a while to play through the system. Um, you're seeing other signs, even though the aggregate numbers are very strong, of uh, stresses in segments of the economy, such as in lower income consumers. Uh, but that being said, it, it's hard to argue that the probability of a soft landing hasn't risen materially. Uh, and if you look at the data over the last several months, you've seen uh, a, a consistent fall in inflation with very low cost to activity. So history tells me that we're likely to have a recession. I'm seeing some signs of that mm -hmm. underlying the aggregate data. Yeah. But overall, the economy has certainly been a lot more resilient. And I think the probability of a soft landing has gone up pretty significantly. Can we talk about what type of recession we might see? Will this be a garden variety recession where really it's felt all over the economy? Or, you know, I've heard some people raise the possibility we could see a rolling recession. Maybe it impacts parts of the economy versus everyone all at once. When you think forward into 2024, that uh, downturn that we could see, what does it actually look like? Yeah, and that's the, the key question. And the one saving grace, I would say, in our forecast it is a relatively mild recession we have. Um, we point to the strength of private sector balance sheets, both on the household and the corporate side, that make us think that 
you're not going to get kind of that exacerbation effect that you saw in other, in other cycles. Uh, I would expect most of the pain to be felt on the services side of the economy because that's where the strength's been. Um, as we saw with the data a moment ago, the manufacturing sector has already been kind of struggling. There's some signs that may even be stabilizing. So I would expect it to be a relatively short recession, um, more mild than we've seen in previous episodes, and for most of that brunt to be felt um, on the, the services side of the economy. What does the Fed do with a short, mild recession? Does it cut rates six times? That's, and that's the other key question is I think if we do get that recession, it kind of opens the door for the Fed, the Fed to start cutting. And then it depends about how certain they are that inflation will move back to target in terms of how fast and how much they cut. Right now, we have them cutting about 100 basis points next year, starting to cut around mid-year. Obviously, a lot of uncertainty around that. It seems the balance of risks are to those cuts starting earlier and that more cuts next year. Um, but I think the key of a recession is it gives them certainty um, that inflation will move back to target and that opens the door for them to cut potentially even faster than what we see. Is the U.S. story going to be the story for other developed markets as well? I think that is really, if we're right, that's going to be the key of 2024 is that we see a soft year for the global economy after that resilience we had in 2023. Most of that softness is felt in developed markets. So the emerging market economies hold up relatively well. Growth steps down in a lot of them, but holds up much better than developed markets. So it's really kind of a developed market downturn. Uh, the euro area is arguably already in recession. We think that continues through early next year. We think the UK, Canada also fall into recession. Um, so really that U.S. story you can really spread across to a lot of other DMs. All right, Rob, really great to check in with you. Happy New Year. That is Rob Sockin of City. And uh, it's going to be a fascinating story in 2024. The idea of a developed market downturn, seeing the central banks grapple with that. And EM, maybe the relative bright spot. Yeah, I hope so. But of course, uh, it didn't really start off today. Of course, you had the big uh, sell off in China, which, you know, you know, are they still EM or not? Uh, I mean, technically, they still are. And you saw the sell off there, which there's still a lot of concerns that if the second largest economy, basically the leader of the EM space isn't healthy, then how can the rest of the EM space be healthy? As well, well, that's something we saw yeah. in 2023, right? A lot of investors, at least, eager to treat China kind of separately, EM ex China. How many yeah. times did we say that last year? Yeah, although I don't think Xi Jinping will be ignored as uh of course, so uh, you know, yeah. it's famously said. Well, uh, moving on, coming up, ASML, it cancels shipments of high-end shipmaking equipment to China, of course, which we were just talking about at the request of the Biden administration. We'll have the latest next. This is The Close on Bloomberg. Glenn Close. That's what I was thinking of. I couldn't remember the name fast enough. ASML, it's a Dutch manufacturer of high-end chip-making equipment. It is a core part of the chip cycle here. We've learned that it has canceled shipments of some of its machines to China. This comes at the request, apparently, of President Biden and U.S. officials here who are seeking to clamp down here on China's access to key technology. Bloomberg's Ian King joining us now from San Francisco with more on this story. And Ian, I assume that there is a direct thread between what we learned this morning from ASML and some of the efforts that the Biden administration took uh, earlier in 2023 uh, to restrict access, uh, the, the access that China has to chip technology. Yeah, no, that, uh, that's exactly right. You'll remember going back to 2022, the U.S. brought in new restrictions um, in October last year. It kind of updated those restrictions, tightened them. But what's really happening here is that the U.S. came out and said, hey, at the end of the year, we want you to stop doing this. So in the interim, of course, the Chinese were aware of this and, as far as we understand it, went out and ordered as much as they possibly could, trying to take advantage of the time they had left to get this. Clearly, the Biden administration realized that this was kind of going against the spirit of what they were trying to achieve and have sort of asked the Dutch to sort of, hey, help us out here. Some of this really critical equipment shouldn't be going despite the fact that the ban's not official yet. Yeah. Can you help us? Well, what do you think the impact will be on China? Is this going to severely restrict their access to this type of technology or can they just go somewhere else and get it? Uh, if it's ASML, lithography equipment, the answer is absolutely not. No, I mean, that, that Dutch company is really the, the, the choke point here. And 
That's why the U.S. has focused on the efforts of a company in another country. Nikon is the only other real maker of lithography equipment, but they are thought to be, you know, many years behind where the Dutch are in terms of building this equipment. So you either get it from them or you don't. So we've talked a lot about, you know, what this means potentially for China, but what does this mean for ASML specifically when it comes to its revenue, for example? How much uh, does it need China and that relationship with China? Yeah, I mean, the, the Chinese, by down to the fact that they've been uh, under these restrictions or the looming restrictions have been ordering extremely heavily. You'll also remember that, you know, the Beijing has set aside multiple tens of billions of dollars to try to domesticate its own uh, chip manufacturing industry. So clearly they're an important source of revenue, whether it's for chips, whether it's for chip equipment. We'll see how this pans out. I mean, what ASML has said is like, look, this isn't material. What that probably means is that it's only a certain type of machine that's being restricted here, arguably probably only for one or two customers. So in general, they're probably still shipping a lot. Whether that will be allowed to continue into 2024, whether we'll see more new restrictions, that's clearly the subject of a lot of debate. Um, on the one hand, they're saying we're okay for now, but how long for now lasts, we'll, we'll have to see. Yeah, some important ripple effects here to keep an eye on. And, of course, we're talking about Bloomberg News exclusive reporting that ASML canceled some shipments to, of its machines to China at the request of the Biden administration. What has been the response from China thus far? Yeah, I mean, this is what we're going to have to wait and see. Clearly, they don't like it. They came out pretty quickly with a reaction which was... Uh, displaying their irritation and you know there are arguments out there that say look look what's happening to Apple look what's being said about the iPhone look what happened to for example Micron whose chips were deemed a, a security threat in China so Beijing isn't completely toothless if it gets into a, a more of a tit-for-tat kind of action against some of the US companies that do rely on China for a large uh, percentage of their revenue. Um, hopefully, uh, I think from the US company side and also from the Chinese customer side, there isn't an escalation, but clearly any move where it looks like Washington is being heavy handed and dictating um, you know, strategic yeah. moves onto other companies will not be liked. All right, uh, Ian, uh, always uh, great to talk to you. Ian King has been covering this uh, for decades, does it better than anyone else here at Bloomberg. A closer look here uh, at uh, ASML, I guess, uh, at least for now, uh, caving in to uh, the demands by the U.S. government to stop shipments of these things. And I thought he made a good point here. We kind of forget China is basically 50 percent of ASML's revenue. So I do wonder what their reaction is going to be to this more longer term. Yeah, exactly. And uh, interesting, of course, the Biden administration reaching out to ASML about that. Have to imagine that's a big theme in 2024. U.S.-China tensions and chips. All right, a lot more coming up here on the big program. Stick around. This is The Close on Bloomberg. This is the countdown to the close. Just about 2.30 here in New York with stocks here in the U.S. starting off the new year on the back foot. Similar story on a price basis for treasuries and, well, commodities not doing much better. Abigail Doolittle, she's standing by right now with our commodities close. Abigail. That is certainly true, Romaine and Katie. We have a bit of a risk-off tone here for these commodities. Uh, and the common denominator for all of these asset classes, I would say, is a rising dollar. That Bloomberg dollar index right now, about seven-tenths of one percent, heading to its best day since early September. That, of course, puts pressure on assets denominated in dollars. So New York crude uh, down 1.7 percent. What makes this surprising is the fact that you have tensions escalating in the Red Sea as Iran has sent a destroyer uh, onto the Red Sea. This after, of course, a U.S.-led uh, mission or coalition uh, destroyed, sunk three Houthi ships. But even so, even though you would think that that would create some sort of supply problem or even just the sentiment, we have uh, oil trading lower. T suggesting that there really is a risk off tone for risk assets again on that dollar. Take a look at soybeans, wheat, corn, very similar story. In addition, for some of these grains remain uh, rain weather in Brazil, very healthy, suggesting that growing conditions in Brazil uh, more amenable to some of these crops. That is also creating some selling pressure as the idea that more supply could come on board soon. Yeah, having a real direct impact here on commodities prices, of course, having a big impact on shipping prices as well. And now the geopolitical response is what everybody is keeping their eye on. 
For the latest on those tensions in the Red Sea, Iran, as uh, Abigail just pointed out, has sent those warships to challenge U.S. forces in a key trade group where those Houthi militants have been disrupting shipping. shipping. Uh, Nick Wadham's joining us right now to talk a little bit more about this. And, Nick, we should just point out here uh, that, you know, Iran can send the ship there, its ship, and the technology in that ship, no match uh, for the military power of the U.S. Navy. But I am curious just about the optics of it and whether it will keep shippers away from the Red Sea for much longer. Well, the big question there, of course, is what would an Iranian warship do uh, in the Red Sea if it encounters a commercial vessel and why Iran is sending a ship there? I mean, it's hard to imagine that an Iranian warship would uh, come into contact or open fire on a commercial vessel. I mean, that would just be, you know, an extraordinary development. So far, those have been limited uh, to the Houthi uh, rebels in Yemen, which are backed uh, financially and in some ways via intelligence support uh, by Iran. But, you know, the bigger question there is, okay, you know, is there the possibility of a miscalculation? So you have, anytime you have U.S. warships and an Iranian warship in relatively close proximity, there's always the, the possibility of an accident or uh, a show of force that goes wrong, and that's really what uh, the concern is right now. But either way, what you're seeing here very clearly is that shippers do not want to take the risks right now of going through the Red Sea for whatever reason. I mean, it's just such a, a, a tension point, a, a potential flashpoint. They just don't want to make that uh, risk right now, and that's in some ways why you're seeing those higher oil prices. Yeah, and of course, uh, like you mentioned, those shippers making the decision to not transit that route, even though you do have that U.S.-led protection mission called the Prosperity Garden standing by. And given that that's the case, and it seems like the Prosperity Garden Guardian so far hasn't been able to deter these attacks, is there any talk among the administration about potentially shifting from just deterrence to perhaps going on the offense here? Right. I mean, well, we know that the, that's very much a live debate within the administration. Obviously, you can play defense, but do they go after those Houthi military assets in Yemen directly, eliminate them at the source? I mean, it is raising a lot of questions about this operation. The U.S. and its allies had said all along, listen, this is not uh, a situation where we're going to be able to escort every ship. you got to think of it more like the highway patrol. They're not busting every car that's going over the speed limit, but they hope that just, you know, when you see that that cruiser on the side of the highway, it has a sort of deterrent effect. The big question is, does that work <laughs> in, a, in a situation like the Red Sea when you have so many ships and so much money at stake? And obviously, so far, the answer is no. Uh, and we're all waiting to see what the, what the next step will be. But clearly, one of the options is, listen, OK, we've provided that deterrent effect, hopefully, by having some ships in the region. Now we're going to provide an additional deterrent effect by going after uh, Houthi assets directly in Yemen. Well, I mean, so far, I mean, two of the biggest shippers out there have said they have no plans to return uh, to that Red Sea route anytime soon until this is resolved. And it raises the questions about alternatives here. Uh, even if we don't end up in some sort of, a, uh, you know, actual conflict, military conflict in those waters here, just the presence of those ships and the tension there is causing a lot of folks to find new routes, find new options here. When do those options go from being temporary to something permanent? Well, you know, it's a great question because so much of this is tied up not just with, with the situation with the Houthis in the Red Sea, but also in connection with Israel's war on Gaza. I mean, the Houthis have been very explicit, you know, this coalition is not going to deter us and we're going to do this until Israel is out of Gaza, something that Israeli officials say is not going to happen for a very, very long time. So I think you're going to get to a situation here where the U.S. is going to really have to make some tough choices. Either they get more countries involved, more ships to the region, a real effort to start uh, reassuring uh, shippers so that they can send uh, those their, their commercial vessels through. And it may be possible that the only way you do that is through some sort of military force. Problem with that, of course, is that it risks a broader conflagration, which would make what we're seeing now, the instability we're seeing now, uh, look very, very small and insignificant and really have much broader impact on the global economy. So you can be sure that's what they're wrestling with right now. All right, Nick, really appreciate your reporting. Our thanks to Bloomberg's Nick Wadhams down in D.C. Now, still ahead, we'll get the outlook for cruise stocks in 2024 with Jamie Katz from Morningstar. Our top calls coming up next. This is The Close on Bloomberg.
All right, let's get a view from the sell side with our top calls, the big movers on the back of analyst recommendations. And we start off with Apple. And Apple a day apparently no longer keeping the downgrade away with Barclays dropping its rating on the world's most valuable public company to underweight. That's a sell equivalent. The analyst says he's concerned demand for the iPhone 15 remains weak and he struggles to see any technology upgrades or new features that would make the upcoming iPhone 16 sell any better. Shares of Apple having their worst day since early August. Next up, Moderna getting a shot of confidence over at Oppenheimer, an upgrade to outperformer with Oppenheimer upbeat about the biotech giant pipeline, saying Moderna could have five products approved on and on the market by 2026. That includes a potential RSV vaccine as well as that flu COVID combo vaccine that they've been talking about for a while now. Moderna having a really great day, up about 13%. And let's take a look at luxury fashion group Tapestry. J.P. Morgan adding the stock to its analyst focus list as a, quote, value idea, nudging the price target up to 46 from 41, expecting Tapestry's coach brand to lead revenue growth. The analyst also says the company's overall remains well positioned in the resilient category of premium handbags. Tapestry shares up about 4% on the day. And those are some of our top calls. We do want to say in the sell side space and shift focus to, well, consumer spending and particularly cruise lines. Cruise uh, stocks here are down on the day. Uh, that's, of course, after record gains that we saw in 2023. The big question is, is consumer spending going to hold up and specifically is it going to flow to these cruise line stocks? Jamie Katz joining us right now, equity analyst over at Morningstar to talk a little bit more about this. And let's start off, I guess, with the biggest out there. Carnival Cruise Lines had a phenomenal year last year, as did most of the other cruise line stocks here. What's going to be the driver for this stock, presuming that you expect it to go higher in 2024? Yeah, I think for Carnival, you know, the report going into the holiday season was really pretty good. And when you looked at how bookings were shaping up for the 2024 year, uh, I think they said something like um, two thirds of the itineraries were booked for um, for 2024. And that gives them a lot of visibility into pricing over the next year. So even if there's a certain amount of softness later in the year um, for some itineraries that have not yet been booked uh, or have not been booked as robustly, I think we have a lot of confidence in the current outlook, given that there's not a whole lot of inventory um, left to sell going into the next year. So I expect when we hear from Royal and uh, Norwegian Region later this month or at the beginning of February, we will hear the same sentiment echoed um, from them. Travel has not really uh, conceded um, yet yeah. out of the consumer wallet. So things are looking uh, pretty decent, at least so, from for the cruise sector so, so, with respect to demand. So, Jamie, does that translate into price increases? Should consumers expect to hear, hear that out of these companies this year? I think that's what we heard from Carnival, and I think that's what we'll hear again. And I think Part of it is that there's a way for the cruise operators to um, extract price increases that aren't necessarily as uh, visible as maybe in the past, whether that's through offering, you know, different upsells for spa treatments or excursions or add-ons that that you know, effectively flow into the price, but the willingness to pay for those add-ons ha have has been very robust. And so um, I think consumers will still be willing to pay up for a good experience. So looking ahead, let's look at your ratings right now. So you're a buy on Carnival. You have a buy rating on Norwegian as well. You're a hold on Royal Caribbean, which is interesting because if you look over the past year, three years, five years, uh, Royal Caribbean is the outperformer there. So when you think about how you're thinking about these companies in relation to each other, is that hold on Royal Caribbean on valuations or is there something fundamental going on there? Yeah, there's nothing fundamental going on. I think the business was very much perceived as a better quality business coming out of um, COVID, given that there were significantly fewer equity raises. And so the balance sheet um, was relatively more pristine um, compared to maybe some of the exercises that Norwegian and, and Carnival had taken. That said, I think where we stand now, looking at Carnival and the changes that it's made to the fleet, 
um, scrapping or getting rid of some of the older ships, bringing new, more efficient hardware uh, on, and, and just being a smarter sort of revenue management company um, gives us some confidence that the uh, EBITDA expansion that we're going to see out of Carnival will probably be a little bit more significant than Royal Caribbean going forward. All right, Jamie, great stuff. Got to get you back soon. Jamie Katz over at Morningstar. A closer look at some of the cruise line stocks, including Carnival and uh, Norwegian. And Katie, I have a confession here. Yeah. You know, I've never actually been on a cruise. Me neither, man. Yeah. I would not. I kind of like to be close to shore. You know? I like to yeah. see uh, trees. I like to yeah. see the ground. I like to know, like, yeah. you know, that, you know, there's safety yeah, right. <laughs> there. I, I can and not just off. water here. But but I have people in my family that are like diehard cruise folks. If and and honestly, cruise. they could raise prices 20, 30 percent. And they probably still go. And the add-ons, very important. You got to book the spa treatment, all the uh, additional packages. The spa there. treatment. Do yeah. they do like those spa treatments where they have the fish and it like bites at your toes and the pedicure? Because that would be ideal for a cruise line, right? I mean, you're out in the ocean already. A lot and, you of got, and you got all those like biting fish out there. I'm yeah. sure they can do it. No thanks you on know. a lot of different levels there. Katie Greifel, not interested. In the meantime, coming up here, we're going to talk about the industrial shift in the world of climate. We're going to talk to the carrier chairman and CEO, David Gitlin, in just a second here about how he's making deals to reflect the company's climate focus. That conversation coming up after the break on our Wall Street Week Daily segment right here on The Close on Bloomberg. Welcome back to The Close. It's time now for our Wall Street Week Daily segment, the first of 2024. And I'm pleased to say David Weston, the host of Wall Street Week, <laughs> joins us as he does every day around this time. David, great to see you. Good to see you. Happy New Year. Uh, how are we starting off the new year? We're going to start the new yeah. year with industrial companies mm -hmm. as they are realigning that to really bring focus into their business. Mm -hmm. and, you know, back in December, we talked with the CEO of Honeywell, he's Bimal Kapoor, about his acquisition of security business from Carrier. This is what he had to say about that. This deal further strengthens our capability in security, which I believe is a high growth category. So it fits right in the heart of our building automation business and uh, prepares it for higher growth rate in the future. So, so that's the buy side of the equation. Let's go to the sell side here. We're joined by Carrier Chairman and CEO Dave Gitlin. So Dave, welcome. Happy New Year. Great to have you here. Thank you, David. Happy New Year. You, Back you in too. April, we talked about the Wiesman acquisition that closed actually today. And you said at the time you'd be adding some stuff and subtracting some stuff. You said specifically you'd be getting rid of the security business, which you did. Tell us about the Wiesman business and why that's your North Star, I think you call it. Well, it's a new year, but it's a new era for Carrier. I could not be more excited about the Wiesman deal. I think history will say this is the most profound acquisition and combination that our industry has ever seen because at Carrier, we're global leaders in just about every vertical, every geography around the world. We had a glaring absence, which is the residential space in Europe, which has become the most important, highest growth market in the world. We weren't a real player, so we're number one in commercial HVAC in Europe, but we weren't present in residential. It's become very high growth because everyone is transitioning from gas and oil po powered boilers to electric heat pumps. We're seeing on the commercial side, on the commercial side, our heat pumps were up about 30% last year, but the same is happening about the same percentages on the residential side. So we wanted to get into the space and we are so fortunate to combine what is clearly the single best company in that space throughout Europe, Wiesman Climate Solutions. We closed today. Max Wiesman, the fourth generation Wiesman, officially joined our board today. He now owns about 7% of our company. And we could not be more thrilled to welcome the 12,000 employees to our family. So, Dave, we hear a lot about focus. And focus sounds pretty good to me, <laughs> if you can find it, right? At the same time, are there risks with that as well? Because this is a heat pump company, a really foremost heat pump company. There's been a little bit of softening. Has there not been in Europe in heat pumps? It's one of the beauties of Eastman is that they're very balanced. They actually, yes, they're number one in heat pumps, but they also have a very strong boiler company, so they're able to flex. So if you see boilers kind of creep back in and increase a little bit more than they had been, they can flex that way. Even in the same factories, they produce both heat pumps and boilers. So they not only have flexibility with boilers, they're the only company in the world that prov provides complete home energy management solutions for homes. So they do solar PV, they have battery storage, they have heat pumps, they have a digital overlay that interfaces with that grid, and that's where the puck is going. That's the future. They're the only ones that do it globally. We want to take that technology, bring it to the U.S., and then bring it outside of Europe as well. Do you think the appetite here in the U.S. is the same as it is in Europe for that type of technology? I think it's going to grow over time. It's not there yet, mm -hmm. but I do think what we need to do is provide the value propositions to the customer because mm -hmm. today at Carrier, 
we cool 500 million people a day, and we also consume a lot of the grid's energy. So we at Carrier consume about 3% of the energy from the grid today. So we need to be part of the solution, because what's mm -hmm. going to happen is that everyone's going to get home between 5 and 10 p.m., plug in their cars, turn on their either air conditioning yeah. or heating. Both are going to be electric. Mm -hmm. And you're going to put max demand on the grid between those hours. We need to do load shedding, and we can do that as we start to provide batteries, mm -hmm. storage management, and interface with the grid. That's what we're going to be providing. That doesn't sound like something, though, that you can do solely alone as a company, that you need, obviously, buy-in from regulators at the federal level and, of course, at the local level as well. It's going to be an ecosystem mm -hmm. solution. Yes, yeah. there will be some interface with um, governments. There will be some interface with utilities. It's going to be a solution that we either make or buy batteries ourselves. So it's going to require partnerships. It's going to require ecosystem. But we want to be the front, the front leaders in that space. So these are the acquisitions you're making. What about the dispositions? Uh, we just talked about security with Honeywell. I know you've made a deal on refrigeration. At the same time, you still have fire, both residential and commercial. Where are you with that? Yes, so we're thrilled with the, the what you just saw from Vamal. We're very excited about the deal on the disposition of security. It's a great business. It's going to a great owner in Honeywell. We sold it for about $5 billion, 17x EBITDA multiple. We got the same multiple on the sale of our stationary refrigeration business to hire about 17x EBITDA. What that leaves is our fire business, and we're selling that. We're going to dispose of that in two different pieces. There's our industrial fire piece. That's progressing extremely well. We're in the market, we're in negotiations, we're in discussions with a number of potential buyers there. That's going to be hopefully sold by the end of the first quarter. And then beyond that, we have our residential and commercial fire, which will either spin as part of a public company or a sale process. You have a firm to consolidate here. How long do you think it will take to consolidate? At what point are you back in the market, maybe for further acquisitions? Mm -hmm. Well, what we've said is first we're going to dispose. Then we're going to get our multiple, our debt to EBITDA down to about 2x. At that point, we'll do a share buyback of at least the amount of shares that we issued to Max Wiesman and the Wiesman family as part of the acquisition. So we'll do a buyback of at least $2.5 billion. Once our multiples get back to about 2x, our, our leverage ratio to about 2x, and then we've always said that our long-term focus is growth, both organic and organic. Uh, it's going to take a little bit for us to do meaningful acquisitions, but we will get there after the buyback and after our leverage ratios are intact. What does that organic growth look like? Well, we've said that our, or, our model is 6 to 8% growth annually. And when, what we are doing with our business exits is we've been exiting some of our lower growth businesses mm -hmm. and adding higher growth businesses. So we added Toshiba's very high growth VRF, variable fridge and flow technology, which is very popular in Asia. It's becoming more popular in Europe and the United States. We exited our Chubb field distribution business. That was lower growth for us. We're now adding Wiesman, which is going to be long-term double-digit growth consistently over a period of time. Mm -hmm. So we look at ourselves at a 6 to 8% organic growth type business. Do you think the regulatory environment when it comes to acquisitions, and for that matter, divestitures, will work in your favor when the Wiesman acquisition was announced? Of course, there was a lot of hand-wringing over there in Germany about whether they really wanted to sell this company to a, an American. Let's just call it what it was here. Uh, obviously, they, they let the deal go through, but as you know, that scrutiny has been ra ratcheted up a lot. Over yeah, the there's last scrutiny year. in China, yeah. throughout Europe, in the mm -hmm. United States. The key is to do deals that are good for growth. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you're buying growing businesses, you're investing in the businesses, you're growing the business, we're investing in the German businesses, the German factories, the German people. So we think as long as we're providing good growth, good opportunities for our people globally, the regulatory environment will support. Talking about environment, what about geopolitics? We're coming out of 2023, a lot of geopolitics playing around the world. Uh, how is it affecting Carrier, if at all? We do our best to navigate and be as balanced as possible. We're particularly interested right now. India looks very encouraging to us. We're very interested in Saudi Arabia. Great growth prospects there. We have a very strong presence in China. We have a bit of a China plus one strategy where we invest in China, we'll continue to invest in China, but we also have some level of redundancy outside of China. Europe seems relatively stable to us right now, so geopolitically, we do our best to navigate it because we're a very, very, 80, very global company. 80% of our people are outside the United States. And we've been pretty adept at managing the geopolitics thus far. Well, congratulations on the big deal you're closed today, Dave. Really great to have you with us. That's David Gitlin. He's Carrier Chairman and CEO. So a lot of realignment going on around yeah. the world, often driven by climate. Yeah, absolutely. Here, and I mean, that's a great way to kind of kick us off because we know this is going to be a big issue, not just for yeah. investors overall, but as you said before, uh, with some of the politicians and the big well, elections that exactly. we have. Exactly. It's become year. quite political, yeah. hasn't yeah. it? Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. Particularly in the United States. Mm -hmm. Okay, tomorrow we're going to be talking with Professor Arun Sundarajan of NYU Stern School. We're going to talk to him 
uh, about that New York Times suit uh, involving a chat GPT and whether, in fact, they're violating their copyrights. And on Friday, we're going to continue the conversation about AI with MIT University economics professor David Otter, who's done a lot of work on what this will mean for the workforce. All right, a lot of uh, great conversations coming up here. You catch David every day here uh, around this time for our Wall Street Week daily segment as we round out into the final hour of trading on the first trading day of 2024, a trading day that has U.S. equities on the back foot. As of right now, the NASDAQ Composite and NASDAQ 100 hitting session lows down roughly about 2% here on the day. Maybe a bit of profit taking, maybe a bit of a technical driven uh, rally here. We'll break down all of the price action when we come back after the break right here on The Close on Bloomberg. Just about 3 p.m. here in New York. This is the countdown to the close. Let's get a view from the top. I'm Romaine Bostic. And I'm Katie Greifeld. Interesting start here to the year, Katie. We talk about the big rally that we had yet last year, a rally that I don't think most people really predicted here. So maybe we're seeing a bit of a profit taking today, but the downturn is pretty severe here. We're now talking about a NASDAQ indices, both the composite and the NASDAQ 100, each down about 2% on the day. You can see the S&P only down about nine tenths of a percent on the day, but all those big cap tech stocks deep in the red. Yeah, it feels like we're seeing a snapback of some of the big trends uh, heading into the close of 2023. Of course, stocks down, yields up, the dollar up as well. We'll see how sustainable this is or if everyone is truly just catching their breath. We saw a little bit of the dour sentiment over in China with the CSI 300 down about a percent here on the day. But one of the bright spots, you flip it up here, Bitcoin. I know you're a big <laughs> follower of everything uh, that is uh, crypto here. Uh, looking at Bitcoin back above that 45,000 mark, I'm not sure what this signals, but we talk about that March higher we had last year, which also defied a lot of expectations. That's a good way to start the year here. It's a signal that there's a lot of optimism in the air. You can practically smell it. A lot of speculation that this month, finally, uh, we'll see Does a crypto have a smell? Uh, it's, yeah. It smells like optimism. It smells like citrus, I think. But in any case, a lot of speculation that you will see uh, the first U.S. spot Bitcoin ETF launch perhaps this month. But uh, watch this space. Let's talk about some of the individual movers on the day because there's quite a few. Do I U.S. regulators know that? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know about that. But I do want to talk about Apple. You talked about this call a little bit earlier. But a rare bear for Apple's Tim for Apple, rather, Tim Long of Barclays, cutting Apple to underweight expectations of soft demand. Uh, it was interesting what he had to say about the iPhone 16. No features or upgrades in his view that are likely to make that upgrade uh, cycle more compelling for the iPhone 16. I certainly don't have one. Yeah, I think he could have written that for the 15, 14, yeah. maybe the 13. I don't know. It's don't been know. a while. In any case, yeah. uh, Apple shares down pretty significantly. Let's also talk about Rivian. Another significant downdraft there. Of course, quarterly EV deliveries, they missed estimates delivering just under 14,000 vehicles. The estimate was uh, for a touch over 14,000. Really? I'm surprised. I see a lot of these on the street now. I know. They're just not, I guess they're just not getting that critical mass. That they yeah, needed. those trucks, they kind of yeah. look like frogs. Uh, but yeah, critical mass frogs. is elusive okay. there. Uh, <laughs> you can see Rivian shares down about 11 Percent. And let's also talk about Citigroup. I know that you'll be speaking with Mike Mayo later on in the show. Citi already uh, was the top pick for Mike Mayo among the big banks in 2024. He's doubling down, pun intended. He thinks Citi shares are going to more than double over the next three years, of course, as Citi undergoes what he's calling a metamorphosis. Yeah, that'll be interesting. I mean, it's a bold call, particularly for, we know, Citi Group has been kind of the, the stock disappointment, at least in the banking sector, for years now. Uh, and uh, I don't know, maybe Jane Frazier has found the secret sauce and finally get investors on board, but I'm at least for right now. I'm going to turn the TV on for that one. Are you really? Yeah, usually I walk out of here and I go home, but... I didn't know you owned a TV. <laughs> I think so. We are one hour away from the closing bell. All of you have a TV, so sit tight. Our cross-platform coverage starts now. Come down to the close. Bloomberg's comprehensive cross-platform coverage ahead of the U.S. market close starts right now. This is the countdown to the close. Romaine Bostic alongside Katie Greifeld. We're joined right now by our colleagues. 
Mike Regan and Paul Sweeney. <laughs> Welcome to our audiences across all of our Bloomberg wow. platforms, television, radio, Bloomberg Originals, Absolute and YouTube. Oh, what is this? A sighting <laughs> of Carol Masser and Tim Stanley. Do you remember us? I no, I, I, it's been a while. I mean, hey, I know you guys news. had to take off and deliver all those presidents. Around New the, Year, the world, same but us. Welcome back. New Year, same yeah. us. Uh, we are back in yeah. a big way. How are you feeling, Carol? It's I, great to see you. I am feeling I've much better. Uh, I'm feeling much better. Did get another case of COVID, so now I'm either on my third or fourth case. Um, it's just a reminder. Isn't it right? interesting that it happened right when she got back from vacation? You know, it's I like have, you, the, the plane lands. Mm -hmm. She's yeah. supposed to come back to work the next day. I would have gladly come in, guys, and give. I want to see COVID. the receipts on this COVID. Uh, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> did you save your little? Uh, I didn't save stick, it. I did tweet tester. it out. I did yeah. tweet. Ask hmm. my family. It's not great to have a 20 year old in the house who's home from college, yeah. who all they want to do is spend time with their friends. And they're like, Mom, you've got COVID. You're not coming out of that room. It but was you, kind of a little rough. Uh, well, Carol, but you had all this time off. You know what I did? You, you could have probably caught up on, you know, reading. Uh, ask writing, me, ask me arithmetic. About a, ask me about a streaming series, folks. I have watched it. <laughs> a streaming series. What did you watch? Uh, I watched, uh, I finished up The Crown. Okay. Uh, I watched the Cary Grant series. I watched a little Paris in Love. Can I do that? Uh, uh, I watched a lot of stuff. I'm going to tell you. Um, I watched the David Beckham series. Yes. Also, really you and I great. spoke about this <laughs> at length. Yeah. We did, we did. Um, having said that, in terms of streaming, this is something that's going on in our household. This story comes courtesy of the Wall Street Journal, and it turns out Americans are canceling uh, more of their streaming services. Uh, it's about a quarter apparently have done, kind of said goodbye to some of their prime uh, streaming services, and that's about in the last two years or so. Um, so people are looking at their pocketbooks, Tim, and saying, okay, what do I have money to spend on? What am I using? What am I not? And they're finding that they're cutting back on some of those streaming. Well, think about it. All this stuff tends to add up, especially when prices go up. Katie, we're talking about companies like Apple TV+, Plus, Discovery+, Plus, Disney+, Plus, Hulu Max, uh, HBO Max, formerly HBO Max, now Hulu, now Max, Netflix, Paramount+, Plus, Stars, Peacock, I went through this. I actually <laughs> subscribe to all of these except for two. Wow. It's not good. Big it's spender. Not good. It's okay. almost like there needs to be some sort of bundle where they're all bundled together and you oh, pay a monthly fee to, wow. to one company and you get all of this stuff. I'm trying to think if that's an option. <laughs> Time oh, wait, that's what that's what existed for, you know, like three decades and then right. the unbundling happened and now we're paying more. Well, perhaps, you know, time is a flat circle. Uh, technology is cyclical, I think uh, someone once said. So maybe we'll get back there. Uh, do you guys want to talk about the IRS, though? No, I want to talk about streaming. No, I'd much rather talk about streaming. <laughs> the IRS. The IRS. Where is Katie going? Yeah. Uh, no, so, I mean, is, 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 uh, do they have a streaming service? No, but there was a <laughs> really would great, be a great story series. about the call center at the IRS. The call center, okay. Yeah, All let, right, tell us about the call let center. Let me tell you about it. Uh, I'm going to try here. It must be a lovely here. place. Okay, so <laughs> if you take a look at the IRS's call service level, did you know it was 87% during the 2023 filing season? I did not that know that. If you call the IRS 87% of the time, they would call you back. And that was a big uh, win for them. Treasury Secretary, Secretary Janet Yellen said that the IRS will once again break that 85% this filing season. But this story pointed out, and I thought it was kind of interesting, that if you take a look at the past few months, the IRS call service level, it slipped to about 73% in recent months. So I don't know, they have a lot Why of Why is it going down? Because they're streaming. They're not answering phones, they're streaming. <laughs> they're, they're trying exactly. to keep up with all their different shows across all their different platforms. No, I mean, look, some of it in, in, in truth is seasonal, that during tax season, they hire more workers to help answer people's questions. So mm -hmm. I, I guess it makes sense that during tax season, Romaine, it's higher. Yeah, I don't actually want the IRS calling me. So yeah, exactly. I'm actually okay with this. But if you yeah. called them, I think you would want them I would to never call, call the IRS. Ever. I guess it's I don't a want them to know I exist. It's uh, <laughs> too bad. No. Sorry, I hope they don't Romaine have a television here right now. No, nobody watches. <laughs> no. <laughs> All right. Nobody wants a call from the IRS and people are kind of paring back on streaming. All right, guys. We've can got I can I actually write off as a tax deduction my uh, cost of my streaming services? You can I mean try. you talk about it at work, so do talk I'm not about an accountant. It. Check with your accountant. But he plays one <laughs> on radio and TV. Yeah, every day. <laughs> all right, guys, we got lots to talk about. We're going to be back in less than an hour's time. We're going to continue. The gang is all back uh, beyond the bell. Join us at 4 p.m. Wall Street time as we wrap up the first trading day here in the United States of 2024. We'll see you at 4 p.m. And we continue our markets coverage right here on the close. Counting it down to those closing bells. Just about 50 minutes away here on the first trading day of the year. And in focus, once again, of course, is what's going on in the bond market. Kathy Jones joining us. Charles Schwab's chief fixed income strategist. Happy New Year. Great to see you, Kathy. 
Happy New Year, Ruben. Good to see you. Uh, the bond market, of course, was all the rage, I think, uh, last year for good reasons and for bad reasons. Do you think the fixed income market overall is going to be as central to the broader cross-asset moves in 2024 like they were in 2023? I do think it's going to be really important uh, for the markets because we've now built in the expectation for a lot of rate cuts. And if we know that that um, affects valuation of other assets, particularly risk assets to some extent. So if if the future doesn't look as the market has priced, which is a risk, then, yeah, I think it could play a pretty central role in, you know, the volatility and valuations and performance of other asset classes. There's obviously the big parlor game of where yields go next or maybe they don't go anywhere. I'm looking at a benchmark 10-year at 3.94, your two-year at 4.33. Do you think that that will change materially this year, either up or down? Well, I think it'll change both up and down. Uh, I think there will be a great deal of volatility. Um, but the dilemma we have right now is that uh, we have 10 years um, treasuries right now near fair value if the Fed is headed down towards that 2.5% um, target for the Fed funds rate that's projected in the, in the dot plot. So we're, we're pretty much at fair value. If we get a weaker than expected economy, if we get a recession, even a mild recession, You'll probably see those yields go down to three and a half, maybe a little bit below. But we've done a lot of work now in the bond market in anticipation of those rate cuts at the short end. Similar story with the two year. A lot's been priced in. Um, I think that this two year still has some value here and and the longer end has value just in clipping the coupon. But I think the most market has already priced in a lot of the scenario we're going to see. So we're probably going to react to each and every number that comes out, each and every comment that comes out from you know, Fed officials, give us a lot of volatility. Uh, at the end of the day, maybe not that much movement uh, a year from now in yields. Okay, so there's opportunity at the long end, uh, fair value when it comes to the 10-year, opportunity at the two-year. What about the very front end? Because I'm thinking about, what, close to $6 trillion in money market funds. How sticky is some of that money, especially when you think about how much of it has come in just since last March? And my guess is it's not all that sticky. Once yields actually start to come down, you probably see people roll out the curve somewhat or look into other asset classes for returns. Um, right now, as long as you have that five plus handle, it's really hard for people to look elsewhere. Um, but as soon as we start to get a couple of rate cuts uh, and that comes down, I would assume that that a lot of that money will flow into other asset classes. It may, I don't think sticky is, is quite the way to describe it. I think it's waiting. And then when it starts to move, it'll move you know, in a wave. Well, let's talk about those rate cuts because the uh, pricing has been pretty aggressive, uh, especially towards the tail end of 2023, pricing in about six rate cuts when it comes to the Fed this year. Where do you fall when it comes to how many rate cuts the Fed will deliver? And also, what is the motivation? Does the Fed see a downturn potentially coming? Is that what's going to fuel it? Or is this simply getting back to normal? So we have um, three to four rate cuts of 25 basis points each penciled in for 2024. And I think that probably, you know, it could start as early as March if the inflation numbers really come down or there's signs of slowing. But we've kind of pushed it off to May uh, through the end of the year. Um, I do think that the motivation right now is falling inflation. So there's no reason for the Fed to keep rates, short rates where they are if inflation continues to trend lower because that's just raising real rates and it is a form of kind of tightening financial conditions. And there's no reason to do that if we're slumping into a 2% growth rate, which is, which is sort of what it looks like is going to, to be the case. So all they could do now is kind of follow the trend in inflation lower with a bit of a lag, which is what, you know, what we're getting in terms of policy so far. So it was very backward looking for a while. Now it's a little bit more forward looking, um, but it's not as forward looking as you might see in most cycles when the Fed looks forward and says, oh, you know, we're, the economy is going to slow down because we've hiked rates so much. So we're going to cut in anticipation of that. I think there's still more. Um, running you know, sort of consistently a little bit behind the inflation yeah. trend I, I am, uh, rather than being preemptive. I, I do, Kathy, want to ask you, though, about kind of what we're seeing also in the corporate space, particularly when it comes to spreads and 
the lack of a blowout. I think a lot of people were expecting to see those spreads widen last year. We didn't really get that in a meaningful way. We're now seeing a contraction in those spreads. But then I was taking a look at the Fed's own sort of uh, levels of stress. So, so the New York Fed sort of stress indicator in the fixed income states, that's going up. So I'm just wondering how we reconcile this idea that you have some metrics that seem to be suggesting that there is stress in the corporate bond market at a time when at least traders and investors aren't really reacting by blowing out those spreads. Yeah, I think it's a great point that you're making, Romaine, and that is there's different ways to measure tightness in, in uh, the financial conditions. And, you know, we're used to following the indices that reflect stock prices and credit spreads as the primary metric. But what we're seeing now is the rising real rates, the tightening in credit conditions um, that we see in the SLU's report, you know, in the, the quarterly report from the banks talking about uh, credit conditions and uh, and the stress index. And we are seeing corporate bank bankruptcies rise. We are seeing some increase in defaults. It's been mild so far, but we're seeing it. So I think that um, it's, a, it's a dichotomy here between those different ways of measuring. One is sort of the market-based and the other is, I, I would call more the, the real, the reality-based. In other words, how hard is it to go to the bank and get a loan? How hard is it to go to the capital markets and get a loan if you're not really a top-tier borrower? And I think that is what we're seeing reflected in that stress index where it's getting tougher and tougher particularly for the lower rated companies or the non rated companies to get that financing. All right, Kathy, got to leave it there. Always great to speak with you. Happy New Year. That is Kathy Jones of Charles Schwab. Now coming up, the restaurant chain Pinstripe starts trading on the NYSE. We'll discuss the outlook for the sector with Dale Schwartz, founder and CEO of Pinstripes. Plus, Claudine Gay, the president of Harvard University, falling to the storm of controversy, stepping down as leader of that university. We're going to have a discussion about that a little bit later. And as we head to the closing bells, we'll get insight on the markets from Mike Reynolds. He is vice president of investment strategy over at Glenmead. All that and more coming up. This is The Close on Bloomberg. This is the countdown to the close. Just about 42 minutes until we get to the end of the trading day. The first trading day of the year. There is some green on the screen here, but not quite the names that you would like to see here. Alphabet is in the green on the day. Abvi, Accenture, Intel, Merck. That's the good news here. As far as the rest of the other big cap tech stocks, not a whole lot to see there. Amazon lower. NVIDIA lower as well. Tesla and Apple also down here on the day. We should point out here that the S&P right now is down about nine-tenths of a percent here, but it's really the NASDAQ 100 and the NASDAQ that composite that are the real stories here, each down about 2%. The biggest decline we've seen on those indexes going back uh, to mid-October, mid to late October here. And again, if you're looking for a reason, you, maybe you chalk it up to geopolitics, maybe you talk it up to profit-taking, maybe you talk chalk it up here to some of the concerns here about some of those technical levels. Nevertheless here, when you take a look here, you'll get a better, clearer picture here of some of the moves that we're seeing. Alphabet down about 1.6% here. And I should point out that that chart that we just showed you uh, just a second ago actually had the wrong numbers on them. Alphabet share is down 1.6% here on the day. You're also seeing weakness in other pockets of the market. Keep an eye on Cinemark Holdings, down 1.6% here on some analyst commentary that shows that the big boom that we saw in box office receipts in 2023, that's not going to repeat in 2024. Meanwhile, the VIX is higher on the day. That number is correct, up about a point here. We haven't seen a move higher like that, uh, or at least on a one-day basis going back to mid-December. Let's get Abigail Doolittle into this conversation as we do every day around this time for our options in Side segment. And we are going to take a closer look here, Abigail, at volatility and whether this move higher today is going to be a harbinger for what's to come for the rest of the year. It certainly seems as though it may without even looking at the charts because we're looking at volatility, not just for the VIX. And what's so interesting, Romaine, is the VIX, its volatility is relatively subdued relative to the RVX, the small cap VIX, or the VXN, the NASDAQ 100 VIX, or even the gold VIX, which Kevin Kelly, CEO of Kelly ETFs, you were kind enough to point out that gold has greater volatility than the S&P 500. That doesn't quite make sense. But to Romain's point, what does this mean for volatility going ahead? 
Well, what it means is that volatility should actually be heading higher over the next several weeks and months. Uh, we saw it happen last year where it was a bull market where the S&P was up around 20 percent. And you saw that it the VIX really bottomed around the 12, 13 levels and then it, then eventually moved back up to the 17, 20 range. And so from the December area, we saw that 12, 13, and now we're starting to come back up. So I think it's a harbinger of things to come because volatility is everywhere. But the S&P 500, you touch base on it. You've got 10 points higher in the small caps, which have done very well. We've seen rotation into there. We've seen gold, you know, had a great year last year at 16. Gold is implying a 1% move every day over the next 30 days, right? So with the VIX is 16. So that tells you that volatility is around. It's just not an S&P 500. So it's only a matter of time till it comes to it. Yeah. And that S&P 500 chart right there, a very simple chart. It looks pretty clear if the VIX should go above 15, that it's probably going to go closer to 20. But you know what's really volatile today, Kevin? The socks, those chip socks, that socks right now, uh, it is down 4.2%, uh, heading toward its worst day since October of 2022. I think a lot of it has to do with NVIDIA and folks taking profits and some of those high flyers as the dollar uh, goes higher and yields. What does the VIX for uh, the chip sector look like? Yeah, so that's around 26 as well. So it's almost double what the S&P 500 VIX is. And so you should expect double the volatility in the semis. And that really tells you that we're going into or the volatility market is saying we should anticipate going from growth to value uh, in the semis. And so there could be a rotation out. And if you look, you can see actually the returns last year were phenomenal. But on a P.E. basis, a lot of the chips aren't trading at historically high P.E.s. They're still elevated relative to the market, but it's showing you that there's an easiness paying a higher above market P.E., which tends to lead to higher volatility as people sell out of the bigger names in the S&P 500. So super quickly, in about 20 seconds or so, what's a trader to do from a macro standpoint? Go more toward uh, value? Yeah, I think there's got to be a rotation into value and to scalp a lot of the vol that's out there right now. And so if you see gold sell calls against it, I mean, you got a 16 there, TLT trading higher than the S&P 500 at 17 and a half. So start to sell vol on a lot of these names a month out as we start to digest what's going to happen into the market, especially with earnings coming very soon in the next couple of weeks. Great perspective. Kevin Kelly, CEO of Kelly ETFs. Happy New Year thanks. to you and to your family. And thanks so much for joining us for Options Insight today from New York. This is Bloomberg. Well, Mickey Mouse finally belongs to the public, but with some caveats. Yesterday was the day that Disney's copyright expired on Mickey's first screen release. We're talking about the 1928 short Steamboat Willie. Disney has said they will continue to protect more modern versions of Mickey, however, and you can see, I mean, from 1928 to right now, the appearance of Mickey Mouse has changed quite a lot. Yeah, who wouldn't want to copy this? I, I think it's <laughs> interesting. I, I love when these expirations come up. Remember, I think it was last year, because remember the Winnie po the Pooh yeah. on the original one, and then somebody made this really dark movie yeah. about Winnie the Pooh killing people or something. Didn't that I don't happen with Mickey, too? I don't think anyone saw it. Well, they can do it now with, yeah. the, with the original Mickey Mouse. They could also do it with Peter Pan, and now, speaking of Winnie the Pooh, yeah. Tigger, which oh. I guess Tigger had an extra year for yeah, some no reason, kidding. and but now he's fair game. So I guess we'll get a sequel uh, to that dark uh, Winnie the Pooh movie from last a year. A lot to look forward yeah. to. Uh, we'll see what Disney uh, does when it comes to more modern versions of Mickey Mouse. Of course, uh, you think about Disney, you think about the mouse ears, etc. I would imagine that they want to protect that. Yeah. 1928. That was that was when that was when they started. Pretty amazing that we're still talking about Mickey Mouse. This is the close <laughs> on Bloomberg. This is the countdown to the close. Just about 30 minutes left to go here in the trading day, and that's starting off the year 
on the best foot, Katie. Yeah, not quite if you take a look at the S&P 500. At the broad index level, we are red, but there is some green to be found if you take a look at the sector level. You can see healthcare having a good day, up about 1.5%. Utilities not too far behind, up about 1.2%. Energy consumer staples as well. But then you go down the list to what's not doing well, consumer discretionary, uh, consumer communication services, and information technology not having a happy new year just yet, Romaine. Yeah, you see the big drag there here, down 3% here as a group here. And we talk about the big declines that we're seeing in some of those names. That includes advanced micro devices, down 6% on the day. In fact, all of the big chip stocks are moving lower, as are a lot of the other big tech stocks as well. We're also seeing some softness here in some of those consumer-facing uh, stocks. Carvana down about 8% here. In fact, this is the worst day it's had in about two months here, starting to get a little bit of a trickle in some of the uh, quarterly and monthly auto sales numbers. Now, so far, what we've gotten are primarily the EV numbers for new car sales, but interesting to see what used car sales look like as we get deeper into the month of January and we start to get that look back that might provide a clearer picture. And two interesting stories out there. First on Bitcoin and crypto, I should say. Bitcoin having a great day up above that 45,000 mark, and that's lifting a lot of the crypto stocks, including MicroStrategy, up about 9%. And take a look at EchoStar, the ticker SATS. Uh, the combination with Dish Network and EchoStar, that was completed at the end of the year. Remember, Charlie Ergen had actually split up these companies back in 08, now bringing them back together. Remember, he had held control over both companies for the longest time. Of course, this time, the new combination is going to be less of a focus on the TV side of the business and much more of a focus on what Echo Star did, and that's wireless services, Katie. Let's switch gears here and talk about restaurants and the restaurant business because last week the restaurant chain Pinstripes completed its business combination with Banyan Acquisition Corporation, and today the company started trading on the New York Stock Exchange under the ticker PNST. Joining us now to discuss the business and the outlook for the restaurant sector in the year ahead, I'm pleased to say, is Dale Schwartz. He is founder and CEO of Pinstripes. And Dale, I have to admit, I'm not familiar with Pinstripes, but I'm taking a look at your website. I see bowling and bocce, and I'm getting a little bit excited here. Why don't you just set the scene for us and briefly tell us what Pinstripes is all about and what your footprint looks like? Sure. We're all about gathering and spending quality time together. So we're uniquely combining phenomenal high quality cuisine with in our case entertainment, bowling and bocce. And then our private event banquet business, uh, we host over a thousand events a year, each location. So best in class in that manner. Footprint, we have 15 locations open in 10 states to date with plans to open 150 all over the U.S. and an equal number overseas. And let's talk a little bit about the environment in which you went public. Of course, the story over the last two years has been really the lack of IPOs, the lack of companies coming public. When it comes to your own entrance to the public markets, uh, did you delay that at all? What did conversations around the actual date of taking that plunge look like? No, oh, fair enough. We, uh, well, I started the business 17 years ago had the idea 33 years ago. So we, we've been at this for quite a while. We were considering accessing the public markets four or five years ago for permanent capital. And yes, you're right. The traditional IPO market uh, had some challenges last year. The opportunity for us in, in terms of the Banyan partnership and going public via a SPAC, it allowed us to go public call it last year. So we were the last company to go public on the New York Stock Exchange Friday, the first to start trading today. So we, we, we were a little fortunate striking while the market was hot. I'm curious about the growth story here, Dale. Where, where do we see this company going over the next few years in terms of its reach, the number of uh, locations that it has, and more importantly, of course, obviously the financial metrics themselves? Sure, number of locations, uh, 150 all over the U.S., uh, we'll, we'll cluster in markets that we're either already in or we'll go in. So we have four in Chicago. We're in Georgetown, Bethesda. We'll add additional sites in that market. So we'll, we'll look for quality A markets that have the right residential and office demographic and then the right projects that have co-tenancy, the likes of Apple, Hermes, mm -hmm. Anthropology, Italy, et cetera. 
Do you, and then internet. Yes, sorry, go ahead. Oh, well, I'm just, uh, just to stop you there, just in terms of that build out, though, I mean, that is ambitious. And of course, as you know, there is a lot of competition out there for labor. Uh, there are a lot of, uh, I guess, uh, implicit costs that go into running a restaurant that are much higher than maybe what they were, you know, four or five years ago. How do you manage that side of it? We, we've managed it well um, on the hiring front, fully staffed. Uh, in today's environment, you just have to work a little harder to find talent. And it, admittedly, the fact that we're growing and that we have a very exciting brand helps with recruiting and retaining team members. Uh, and even the site selection is helped as well. Uh, we're, we're best in class. And so landlords are wanting to put us in a lot of these quality projects where they're trying to transform and, and have these developments more experiential. And Dale, I got to say, I'm still stuck on bowling and bocce. Uh, I think that's pretty cool. And when it comes to the competition, I mean, Romaine brings up uh, competition for labor, but just competition in general. You think about all the restaurant chains that are out there. Is it the experiences that sets you apart? How are you thinking about that, of course, as uh, people really are having to dig deeper into their wallets, given how high prices are right now? No question. P people want something unique and different. Uh, so uh, what we're doing is very unique in that we're combining both food with entertainment. And then, yes, I mentioned the private event facet of our business, but we're also doing it, call it in a sophisticated, fun manner. So as I've shared with others, we don't sell Red Bull. Uh, it's just quality. So, but yes, the, the consumer is looking for something different. And we've been doing that for 17 years. We'll continue to make changes and refinements to keep it fresh and new, but, but those trends are real. All right, Dale, well, really appreciate you stopping by on what I'm sure is a very busy day. That is Dale Schwartz. He is the founder and the CEO of Pinstripes. Now coming up, it's the top three, where we focus in on the top three movers and shakers at the center of the day's biggest stories. That's next. This is The Close on Bloomberg. All right, time now for the top three. Every day at this time, we do a deep dive into the people at the center of today's top stories. And joining us now, I'm thrilled to say, Scarlett Fu. Scarlett, who are you watching? So I'm watching Jim Harbaugh. He is the University of Michigan football coach because a day after leading the Wolverines to an overtime victory against Alabama at the Rose Bowl, the questions today really center on what is going to happen next season because before yesterday's Rose Bowl game, he hired the super sports agent Don Yee. And Don Yee has deep ties to the NFL. He reps uh, Tom Brady and Sean Payton, among others. So people are thinking he's going to leave Michigan and go off uh, and coach in the NFL once again. Yeah. Um, so, as you know, I hate Michigan. And, <laughs> I mean, and Harbaugh, of course, you know, he was a, a Bears quarterback for a while. Not a good one. but So I really have no real affinity for him. But did he actually have success in the NFL? As well, a, I mean, as a coach? Yeah. He coached the 49ers, yeah. and they to, went to the Super Bowl. They did. They did not win it. They, they went not. to the Super yeah. Bowl. Yeah, okay. but you know that's a that's a coin co coin toss whether you win it or a not. coin toss. Yeah, okay. I, mean, I haven't been to yeah. the Super Bowl, so I'm not going to throw stones there. I also know very little yeah. about. Well, football. you can't run the block either. So that's I mean, run, run the block, run the ball. Can. I understand is also <laughs> important. Let's move swiftly along because I don't know much about football. Because I want to talk about Claudine Gay, of course, the Harvard president. She's resigned, ending a six-month tenure uh, marked by controversy. Of course, uh, there was big controversy over how she handled anti-Semitism at Harvard. And also, uh, in recent weeks, a lot of allegations of plagiarism, all culminating in today, finally resigning after really attracting, uh, I don't know if you want to even call it scrutiny, the level beyond that from yeah. donors, uh, of course, uh, from students and from politicians as well. Yeah, alums like Bill Ackman kind of leading the way. The conservative media has really been um, on this uh, with leading accusations on plagiarism or inadequate citation. You decide which one it is. Who's replacing her? Uh, there's an interim president coming in. Alan Garber. 
he, I mean, we don't know how long he's going to be there before they figure out what the next step is. All right. Uh, I'm keeping an eye on, uh, well, the, the, the obviously the beginning of the year, so we start to get a lot of the hedge fund returns for 2023. Mm -hmm. Of course, a year that was a phenomenal year if you were a passive investor. I wonder how some of these active investors did here. You take a look at uh, Rob Citrone on the screen there, as well as the folks over at D.E. Shaw. Uh, joining us right now to talk a little bit more about this is Catherine Burton, who covers this for us here at Bloomberg. And let's start off with D.E. Shaw. This is uh, obviously kind of like the, the quants quant fund, if you will, at least the origination of it uh, was. 10% return last year. Yeah, which yeah. for its yeah. peers yeah. is about, uh, say, upper quartile, I would say, mm -hmm. as far as what we yeah. know right now. You sound like a true quant by citing quartiles <laughs> there, here. Is that good? I try. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So that's a pretty good yeah. return. Um, mm -hmm. That fund that was up 10% usually in most years is double digit, so it's a little bit below its own historic average. Mm -hmm. But um, given what its peers have done, and some of them have not done really well, that's it's not bad. And then you think about the S&P 500 up 20, 22 percent or so, and maybe that 10 percent doesn't look so awesome. But what was D.E. Shaw actually investing in that uh, main hedge fund that led to those returns? Well, they're um, a multi-strat, so they're across many, many different um, strategies. And they don't, uh, the investors don't know that much about where the, mon where the returns are coming from. But uh, my sense is that a lot, like a lot of multi-strats, they did not do so well in equities because um, the equity market was driven by so few shares. So I'm, get, I'm thinking that maybe that was the case with D.E. Shaw as What well. about Citron's Discovery Hedge Fund? What was the winning bet there or the winning formula there? Oh, well, he is a macro-oriented fund and also emerging markets. Uh, so I uh, am told that he did... Uh, made money in Latin American bonds, mm -hmm. as well as some equities and some U.S. credit as well. When do we expect to uh, get uh, some of the more uh, additional results out of some of the other head funds? Those will probably be uh, early next week or late this week, and we'll be running a big story about it. <laughs> All right, and well, I'm sure we'll talk to you then. Uh, Catherine Burton helps lead our coverage here at Bloomberg on what's going on in the hedge fund space here. And we talk about this idea of those phenomenal gains for all the major indices here in the U.S. And, yeah, I guess it depends on the strategy here, but maybe 10 percent is good enough. Maybe. Well, after that, that's after fees, right, or that's yeah. before fees. Yeah. If you go the passive route, the fees are fairly minimal. And it's just interesting because for so long, I feel like, especially over the past year, people have been saying that uh, this is a time for active management. This is a stock picker's market, et yeah. cetera. I, I think you've heard that before. I think we've heard I, I've that heard that together. from active managers, yes. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and, I mean, it's just it is so yeah. hard to beat these indexes. First, you had big tech dominating everything, and then you had – everything dominating everything with that big broadening out that we saw in the last two months. Well, let's see if our next guest has some insights here on where we go next here. A conversation coming up with Mike Reynolds. He's the vice president of investment strategy over at Glenn Mead, who says a new year, tabula rasa for investors. That conversation coming up after the break right here on The Close. This is Bloomberg. This is the countdown to the close. Romain Bostic alongside Scarlett Fu with 10 minutes until we get to the closing bell. Stocks pretty much around the session lows here. A pretty significant sell-off, particularly when it comes to those big cap tech names. Yeah, although the outlook for the big cap tech names has not changed any since we were last here. Yeah. It's like new year and new perspective on things, right? Um, the economic data that we got today continued to show the economy performing less better than what people had expected, which is pretty much what we knew would happen after a year and a half worth of interest rate hikes. Yeah, I'm not sure really anything really changed from today versus, you know, where we were, you know, a couple of weeks ago here in terms of the economic picture mm -hmm. here. Uh, and we should point out, too, that a lot of these names that are selling off, we're talking about names that were up 50s, 60s, some cases doubling last year. So maybe this is just a bit of profit taking in the absence of, of any real catalyst. Yeah. Also, there are some markets that sold off last year and continue to sell off. Uh, FXI, the ETF that tracks Chinese stocks, for instance, continuing to falter after some data showing Chinese factory activity at a six month low. That has huge implications, of course, for commodities as well. Well, it'll be interesting to see if this is a true sell-off or maybe just a little bit of a rotation uh, as evidence uh, by some of the things that are getting bought, particularly in the cyclical space. Let's get some insights out of Mike Reynolds and see what he has to say. He's vice president of investment strategy over at Glenmead, joining us now to count down to the close. And I do want to start off with that cyclical trade because for the last few weeks, really the last couple of months, we did see some pretty meaningful outperformance by small caps and cyclicals. And even today where everything is down, 
those names still are, at least on a relative basis, the outperformers. Is that something you see lasting into 2024? Yeah, thanks for having me on today. It's really not something that we see lasting into the new year as investors start to take really a sober second look at what the economic environment is going to look like in the year ahead. We look back into 2023, the consensus was calling for no, or excuse me, was calling for recession. We didn't end up getting one and markets rallied. And uh, we look at this year, consensus not calling for a soft landing and perhaps um, those going against the grain may be right going forward. So, you know, we look at the, the environment we see now as recession based case going forward. Uh, a number of leading indicators we look at, mostly soft indicators in the U.S., survey based, both we're looking at PMIs, we look mm -hmm. at consumer sentiment surveys, continue to point to recession really being the base case for this year. Um, if that's the case, small caps should be more economically sensitive and thus underperform in the year ahead mm -hmm. as investors again start to look ahead and perhaps take that sober look at what 2024 could look at. It's not all surprising to us to see uh, if we would see small caps underperform. I am curious just on that recession call, just, just to kind of reconcile that with some of the commentary we've gotten out of the Fed, of course, coming out of that December 13th uh, rate decision where we saw that dot plot and we saw Fed members overall basically saying, look, we do see economic strength persisting into 2024. They don't necessarily see that recession. And more importantly, there was seemed to be a lot of discussion about this idea that while economic growth may moderate, it will still avoid that ultimate scenario of a recession. We looked at that dot plot a little bit differently than I think the consensus did. What we saw is, yes, more rate cuts for 2024 and beyond. Um, but the detail there is that rates should stay above neutral until at least 2025. Mm. Historically, we have never seen rates stay this restrictive for this long and not result in recession. There's all kinds of talks about the long and variable lags of monetary policy, and we're still in the thick of what a reasonable lag on that policy could be. We'd argue that the clock probably started for real on recession, uh, fall 2023, and the clock really starts to run out at the end of 2024. So beware of those long and variable lags. They come, and uh, it, recession is, is definitely possible this year because of that tight policy is going to stay tight mm. for the, uh, the remainder of the year. Okay, if recession is definitely possible at the first sign of any kind of weakness, uh, meaningful weakness that could lead the economy to shrink, wouldn't the Federal Reserve just step in with interest rate cuts that would then get all the animal spirits going? The question is, would the economic devastation have already been wrought before they can come in and can they actually prevent the widespread uh, proliferation of unemployment and the contractions in GDP that, that always come along with that. Uh, you know, we, we look at the historical record when monetary policy gets tight, typically someone gets caught off sides and that ends up having a big impact on the broader economy, perhaps the financial system. Um, you really don't know what those look like ahead of time until they start to pop up. Mm. We saw the first victim of that around Silicon Valley Bank. Uh, the Fed and, and, and the uh, FDIC stepped in pretty uh, decisively there, but there could be more on the horizon that could uh, spell economic trouble in the U.S. So it's, you know, just because the Fed cuts doesn't mean that you're always through uh, the woods right. in a recessionary period. And there could be sort of cascading effects through the economy that could affect earnings, which right. really the investor, that's all that matters is the earnings and the price you pay for them. So these cascading effects, it could take a while to show up because as you mentioned, um, of course, the long and variable lags. How do you position then accordingly as you wait out uh, this scenario, waiting for the, the different signs to show up? As it stands now, we're recommending investors to maintain an underweight to equities. The flip side of that is you're actually finally getting paid to own bonds and cash. Cash is not just a source of liquidity anymore. There's actually real returns to be had there. As we look ahead to that period and what a recession could look like, investors have to stay on their game looking ahead. Perhaps they can see the green shoots at the end of the tunnel. If we do get that recession, when you start to see the leading indicators turn over is when you really want to get constructive on risk and start adding that back into your portfolio. We think it's a little premature to be taking that step now. Yeah. Um, but you also have to have a look at valuations because if, if th things start to get materially cheap and sentiment really starts to blow out, you can have some really attractive buying opportunities and periods of stress around those economic events. There, there are certainly people kind of perched or waiting for that moment. Some people already think maybe that moment is here. But I'd be remiss in not pointing out the idea of the premium that you normally get to buy stocks versus uh, treasuries versus fixed income. That premium just isn't there, at least not 
on right now, Mike? We, we're seeing exactly the same thing. We have a proprietary measure that we look at valuations, particularly large cap growth stocks at the 89th percentile. Uh, that's getting to some pretty extreme levels versus things like U.S. small caps, which actually look relatively fairly valued at this point in time. You know, you can't forget longer term, the number one determination of what you're going to get in the long run on your returns is the starting point valuations. And for long term investors, there has to be a valuation discipline there. And as it stands now, we're seeing those parts of the large cap market, particularly around the growthiest names, continuing to look extended. Uh, which could suggest that there is some downside there if we do get an economic event that forces people to rethink how we price some of those 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 issues. All right, Mike, great to catch up with you. Mike Reynolds over at Glenn Mead helping us count down to these closing bells. A little less than three minutes to go here, Scarlett. We're still low on the day, though, off the lows of the day. But when you look at kind of what's leading us lower, obviously we talk about the Magnificent Seven, mm -hmm. those big cap tech stocks. But when you see like 7 8% declines in cruise line stocks for some reason, as well as in a lot of the consumer-facing stocks, it raises a lot of questions. It raises a lot of questions. It also raises these concerns that this is the time that you're going to start to see the consumer really start to weaken. Yeah, I think that's the big fear here, and maybe that's why some folks are sticking by those recession calls. We want you to stick with us because we are moving closer to those closing bells as we take you to the bell and beyond. Beyond the Bell, Bloomberg's comprehensive cross-platform coverage of the U.S. market close starts right now. And right now we are two minutes away from the end of the trading day. Romaine Bostic alongside Scarlett Fu. We're counting you down to the closing bell and here to help take us beyond the bell. It's a global simulcast with our friends Carol Masser and Tim Stenevik. Welcome to our audiences across all of our Bloomberg platforms on the first trading day of the new year, a trading day that has stocks deep in the red. Yeah, definitely deep in the red across the board. Uh, the Nasdaq in particular taking it on the chin. And I'm looking at something like the Sox, which is down about 4%. We know the story. It's been among the most read about ASML um, holdings seemingly to, per, you know, not ship certain pieces of equipment to China under pressure from the United States. So again, politics getting into the world of technology, specifically when it comes to the semiconductor world. Every name in the Sox, I should say, is down in today's session. Rich Weiss over uh, at uh, American Century Investments actually thinks we're going to be seeing a lot of red scarlet this quarter. He's pretty bearish. He thinks that we're going to see a 10 to 20 percent crack in the equity markets just in the first quarter or second quarter of the year. He thinks a lot of that has to do with the fact that the market is pricing in more rate cuts than the Fed is going to do. He does not think that there's going to be six rate cuts this year. But he said cash was king over the last two years, and it continues to be king until we see more of a pullback in equities. Yeah, we just heard the same from Mike Reynolds of Glenmead, who says you want to avoid equities and stick with fixed income and cash because you're getting paid to wait. And he still sees, he says recession is not off the table, despite what everyone, uh, hmm. the consensus here. Yeah, you're still getting over 5% here on some of those T-bills here. And of course, even if you go out on the duration spectrum, you can still lock in 4% rate, which given the drop in inflation, seems like a pretty good value proposition for some folks, at least for those folks who are scared of what could come for the equity markets. At least here on this day, it was a down day almost across the board. As we get the closing bells here in New York, the Dow Jones Industrial Average trying to poke into the green. It's been oscillating between gains and losses for a good portion of the day. Right now, it's up about 30 points. Uh, of course, we have to wait for these numbers to settle, but that would be good for a gain of about a tenth of a percent. Meanwhile, the S&P 500 decidedly to the downside, lower by about six tenths of a percent. The Nasdaq composite, well off the lows of the day, but still going to finish the day down by about 1.6 percent. And the Russell 2000 closing out the day down 14 points or seven tenths of a percent. All right, a quick check on the S&P 500 in terms of winners, losers. You had 262 names, Scarlett, to the upside, 241 to the downside. So almost an even split uh, behind kind of that major market average close. It might be an even split, but you look at what sectors are leading to the downside, and that tells you a lot about why the indexes, particularly net, the NASDAQ 100, falling the most uh, since late October. You've got tech of all stripes essentially leading to the downside. Semiconductor stocks, tech hardware, software and services, media and entertainment, all down at least 1.3%. On the upside, you've got telecom services names like your Verizon or AT&T, pharma names like Moderna, and food, beverage, and tobacco. Definitely one of your defensive sectors gaining at least 1.8%. All right, guys, let's get to some of the individual gainers in this uh, Tuesday trade. Citigroup up about 3.1%. Mike Mayo of Wells Fargo says Citi shares to double over the next three years to one 
119 a share in 2026, stock closing at about $53 a share. He says the bank's metamorphosis should make it more profitable. The restructuring he's talking about taking place under CEO Jane Frazier. He says Mayo, uh, Mayo expecting the bank to become simpler and, again, more profitable. If shares rose above $100, folks, that would mark its highest level since 08, according to our data here at Bloomberg. Company does report on January 12th. Remember, those bank earnings are not so far uh, away from us. Moderna, Scarlett, you mentioned it. Moderna up 13%, top in the S&P 500, top in the NASDAQ uh, as well. Uh, back in favor today after dropping about 44% last year specifically. Uh, this coming from Oppenheimer, upgrading the stock to a buy set. It expects the biotech to have five products approved by 2026 uh, and giving the stock a $142 a share, 12 to 18 month price target. The stock closing at about $112 uh, a share, $112.50 to be exact. This may feel random. If Katie was here, she would totally get it. But Abercrombie and Fitch rallying today, it gained 285% last year, guys. Remember, we were all focused on NVIDIA. Well, check it out. It was quite a gainer <laughs> last year. It's rallying again today, up another 3%. Um, I don't know why it's rallying. Um, late December, the company talked about, you know, kind of removing maybe some of its supply chain to avoid the Red Sea. It's a little worried about that. There's a kind of a news connection, but no real specific catalyst. But investors continue to pour money into it after way outperformance, Tim. In I missed. I, knew, I missed that right? last year. Yeah, random. Okay. Uh, hey, let's go to decliners. No shortage of decliners today. We got to talk about Apple shares uh, having their worst day since September, down 3.6 percent. This thanks to analysts at Barclays, uh, who cut their rating on the stock, also lowered uh, their price target. The concern here is uh, weakness in iPhone. Uh, they did some channel checks and said they're underwhelmed with what they're seeing with iPhone sales. And they're concerned also uh, that the next iPhone, the iPhone 16, which, you know, it's a little early to be talking about that uh, if you're a consumer, but if you're an analyst, you're not. It's not so early to be talking about that. They're concerned that it won't have the features that will prompt people to upgrade. Uh, shares, what does Mark Gurman uh, say? I, I mean, not, he's the only person I listen he's to. He's the only person. Because everybody else knows. gets it wrong. You and so me I, both. I, hey, yeah. uh, those are some true words, Romain. I mean, yeah. he, he really <laughs> <laughs> he has a perfect track record. Yeah. I haven't asked Mark about this stuff, but um, you know, Mark, get yeah. in touch. We'll be talking call to him. Mark. You know, he's like are you guys talking to him later? Yeah. yeah, we are. Okay, so it's not, it's not even an external call. You know? so, so tell me what he says. <laughs> no, no. Tell me what he says about this. Um, it's not just iPhones though that uh, has the company uh, that has the uh, analyst concern. What else They're, do they sell? Uh, Macs, iPads, and wearables. Oh, right. They're concerned what's about a lack then? of bounce yeah. back. What, what's what's not uh, included? Remember there? when they came out with that polishing cloth? Uh, like Service, I guess. Air tags. Yeah, air tags. I love air tags. You never lose them. I uh, found my luggage. Okay, let's even air tag. <laughs> let's move on. ASML holding. Uh, I want to look at uh, ADRs of uh, ASML shares falling. ADRs, I should say, falling 5.3 percent. Carol mentioned this at the top that uh, shares of the Dutch semiconductor manufacturing equipment maker uh, were under pressure after our Bloomberg News report uh, that the company canceled shipments of some of its machines to China. This at the request of the Biden administration. We're actually going to be speaking with Ian King a bit, little bit later in our program to get more details on uh, what's going on here. Investors sending shares shares down 5.3%. And then Rivian, let's talk EVs. Uh, shares plunged as much as 11.5% earlier in the session. They finished down 10%, all due to uh, fourth quarter deliveries, missing estimates. Uh, the question is, is what does 2024 look like? And we talked to Ed Ludlow about this a little earlier. Uh, and there's some confusion about the mix of, you know, they make basically make three products right now. They make those Amazon delivery vans, they have the SUV and they have the truck. So are they actually going to deliver more of those Amazon delivery vans uh, in the first quarter of this year when Amazon is, is less busy with the holiday season? We're going to have to wait and see that. All right, let's take a quick look at what happened in the yield space here. Some modest gains on the yield side of the equation as the sell-off in Treasuries resumes here. About seven basis points higher on the two-year yield on the day here, back to about 4.3 here, and you see the benchmark 10-year yield higher by about five basis points. All told here, most of these moves uh, are relatively modest, so we should point out with the yield curve shifting higher, and then you look at what we saw in the swaps market as well as an options market, you do have some folks pairing uh, some of those more extreme bets mm -hmm. on Fed rate cuts just a tad here. Uh, maybe we won't get eight of them uh, this year. Maybe just, maybe, I don't know, it's seven and a half. Right? Yeah. Eight I don't, I don't know what these people are betting on. As here. the economy mm -hmm. slows down, slowly well, slows down we, at that. Don't you feel like if we have to get eight cuts, no, the economy's falling apart. Yes. Like, that's pretty yes. aggressive. That's, uh, yeah, there's no debate on that. Right? Yeah. yeah.
Yeah. Well, I mean, how much attention should we pay to the data that we did get today? Um, S&P Global, U.S. manufacturing, construction spending, both snapshots of the manufacturing sector, not great. Um, things are not falling no. apart, but not great. And that kind no. of kind of sets the hasn't, tone. But hasn't that been weak forever, though? I mean, I mean, and, and I, but, but we go back to like the start of last year, right, when everybody was looking at those manufacturing numbers, looking at leading indicators and saying, oh, my gosh, the recession is in. And it never happened, and partly because the services side, at least here in the U.S., held not only held up, but actually improved uh, to a certain degree that really managed to boost this economy. Yeah, we were just talking yeah. about, was it with Alison Traeger or one of our market yeah, guests? Yeah, Alison Traeger. Specifically, though, about how the higher end consumer... Does Carol not remember who she spoke to? <laughs> uh, you know, I guess, blame COVID. I blame COVID. Hour. Oh, you got the COVID fog. Or, what they bring, or, <laughs> or I just have a fog. Yeah. No, but what's interesting, the higher end consumer, they still, their balance sheets are still doing okay. It's the lower end consumer. You know, what will we see in terms of the U.S. consumer here in 2024 in the first couple of months? Yeah, now that do the they holiday slow season down? is over, like where does the spending yeah, go? Yeah, exactly. I mean, I think the, the key number to watch, of course, this week is jobs and, and what the employment report looks like for December, Romaine. And, and, and that's the most important. And, you know, if people are still getting jobs and if companies are still hiring, then the economy is good. I mean, it's kind of as fundamental as that. If, if the economy is still adding hundreds of thousands of jobs every quarter, um, then the consumer is still in that position to spend that money on services. Yeah, it's still adding, though. But, I mean, you think about some of the data points that we've gotten that still shows uh, consumers are under a, a de certain degree of stress that they weren't under maybe a couple of years ago in terms of uh, their cash balances being drained down, uh, credit card we balances going up. So there's a lot there. Right that may not there. be the yeah. gloom and doom recession call, but there's certainly not necessarily the free spending, uh, I think, feeling that we had maybe like two or three years yeah, ago. Yeah, people are canceling their streaming services, right? It's, no. I mean, it is, back to Alison Traeger's column earlier, it's what she called the pandemic pandemic dividend. And it's going away after three years. Hey, one thing we were remiss. I just want to point out, J.P. Morgan uh, closing at its highest level on record. So just thought we'd put that out here. The stock was up about 1.2%. Yeah. They report earnings January 12th. So we'll get into that Mark earnings. Mark your calendar. Yeah, it's good. <laughs> it's so it's good for good. Jamie Diamond. Yeah, it is good yeah. for Jamie Diamond. Hopefully he gets a fat bonus this year. <laughs> I, think, I, think he I think he'll be okay, Roman. Really? I think he'll be okay. Oh, okay. All right, the fog is settling in. I mean, I, I don't need know. To say it's goodbye. hard to get by on $30 million a year. <laughs> Ouch. Um, all right, that's a wrap, guys. Our first trading day of 2020. 24 Beyond the Bell, our cross platform coverage, radio, TV, YouTube, and of course, Bloomberg Originals. We will see you for the Wednesday trade tomorrow. And as we say goodbye to our radio colleagues, our coverage here on Bloomberg Television continues the first trading day of the year and a look ahead to 2024 and Wall Street's expectations for the year ahead and, well, what they got wrong in the year that just passed. That's coming up next on The Close right here on Bloomberg. All right, the first trading day of the new year is in the books, and for a lot of folks, it might be one that they want to forget here. The S&P 500 closed out the day down by about six-tenths of a percent, moves on the NASDAQ Composite and the NASDAQ 100, amounting to a drop of about 1.7 percent, while the Russell 2000, a seven-tenths of a percent decline here on the day, a relative outperformer compared to the others, while the Dow pretty much went nowhere. Now, of course, one trading day doesn't necessarily make a trend, and we should point out the start of every year brings a certain level of repositioning, whether it's for tax reasons, or simply a reassessment of portfolios coming off their most recent year. You had some bright spots here on the day, including Moderna, which had a great rally, up about 13%. MicroStrategy and a lot of the uh, crypto-related stocks also rallied hard here on the day, indicative of the idea that there are folks out there willing to take some risk, and more importantly, some folks out there that are finding maybe value, dare I say, at least on a relative basis. And that goes back to the question that the Fed and, quite frankly, a lot of policymakers are going to have to contend with this year. As risk appetite starts to pick, up, pick back up, assuming that it does here, the big question is, is there anything that needs to be done about it? The rally that we've seen in Bitcoin last year, up about 160 percent, back above that 45,000 level today, is that something broader? that folks are going to keep an eye on? Is that something broader that might feed into the rest of the market? Or is, does this become that idiosyncratic story, that so-called stock-picking story, Scarlett, that we've heard from so many guests on this show over the past few weeks? Yeah, it's a good question. And of course, you look at what happened today in the markets, and Bitcoin seems to be a bit of an outlier outlier with lots of red arrows across uh, different asset classes. Let's now transition to our big take because we're focusing on the year ahead and specifically what Wall Street is forecasting for 2024. So let's bring 
in now Gina Martin Adams, Chief Equity Strategist at Bloomberg Intelligence. And the range of options really is everything from a massive rally to a massive sell off. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, with most banks and advisors and asset managers seeing kind of a middle of the road scenario. How much of what we're seeing today is kind of indicative of what we can expect for the first month of this year, a consolidation of the manic gains we got at the end of last year? Yeah, so our, our work on sentiment would suggest we got extremely overbought by the end of December and we were due for a cool down coming into this year. We run our own proprietary market pulse index. And what this does is just give us sentiment signals from the market itself. It's not a survey of anybody. It's not what people are saying. It's what they're actually doing with their money as reflected in movements in the equity market. And it reached manic territory at the end of December. The last time we got there was at the end of July. Uh, we had a 10% correction in stocks that manifest over the, quarter, uh, over the third quarter. Well, we also got there at the end of January last year and had a nice consolidation phase uh, result in the spring. So our work would suggest that you're headed into some kind of consolidation in the very early parts of this year, just based upon the idea that you reached mania in the equity market toward the end of December. Mm -hmm. Now, this means nothing or very little for what to expect for 2024 as a whole. It's just reflective of very short-term conditions. Longer term, I do think it's very clear that the bottom was made in October of 2022. We've been digging our way out of that low since late 2022 in the large cap index. The small cap index is still yet to be determined. It's been in this range trade right. for most of the last two years. And that probably is really the key to 2024 is will the small cap index finally dig its way out or will it be stuck in this malaise that it's been stuck yeah, in? Have you been encouraged some though by, by, by some of the outperformance that we saw over the last few weeks? I have and I haven't yeah. been. We were yeah. just discussing this actually on the desk the last couple of hours yeah. because we've broken out but not so decisively to inspire a tremendous amount of confidence. The Russell 2000 is back to testing that top of that range trade that existed for the better part of the last year and a half mm -hmm. at right around 2006 on the Russell 2000. So anywhere between 2000 and 2006 is the top of the range. Maybe we've just gone back to test that top of the range and we're going to break higher, which would be a very solid positive condition, but it's still a maybe. How much of a conflict do you see between what's happening in the stock market, particularly big cap stocks and the economy? Because the yeah. Russell 2000 certainly is more sensitive to the eco data. They're cyclical yeah. and they will kind of follow what the data show. But you look at the Magnificent Seven, for instance, and yep. the economy. Are they at loggerheads? Yeah, it's an excellent question. It's something that I talk a lot with clients about uh, because many people look at the trends in the economy and they think, why is the S&P 500 back to testing all-time peaks? And in any given cycle, what drives stocks is earning trends. And earnings trends are not always consistent one-to-one -one with what's going on in the economy. And very clearly in the S&P 500, we had a very significant earnings recession develop in 2022. That was a big part of the reason for the market's weakness in 2022. That earnings recession ended within the first half of 2023, and we're starting to see earnings growth emerge now. So the S&P 500 is following along with earnings trends very rationally, very consistently. That earnings rotation has been led by the Magnificent Seven and some of the tech stocks. So tech is the only sector in the S&P 500 making a relative new high. And that very rationally reflects what's going on with earnings trends. On the other end of the spectrum, you have the Russell 2000, which as we talked about, made a new low in October 2023. So it's been going on for a full year. The Russell 2000's lagged earnings response relative to the Russell S or to the S&P 500 is responsible for really weak conditions in the Russell 2000. We have yet to see any material signs of recovery emerging in the Russell 2000. Yeah. It certainly is in consensus expectations, but it's much more indicative of the economy, much more closely tied to what's going on in the economy, with the S&P 500 obviously detaching from the economy quite rationally due to earnings trends, which are not necessarily driven by domestic conditions. Is there a sense, though, I mean, when we talk about this idea of whether there is a direct correlation between the economic conditions and then what ultimately feeds into these numbers here, is there an idea here that for investors who are trying to track those economic conditions, do they have to do that from, I guess, a sector by sector, even a yeah. stock by stock thing? Or is there a sort of a basket way uh, to play that? You know, I think that there are, we have certain economic indicators that are much more important than others. You certainly don't need to follow all 250 some odd economic indicators that represent the yeah. United States. Not, not all of them are necessarily going to be relevant or indicative of earnings trends at yeah. large. So when we look at things like what's really historically been relevant for forecasting S&P 500 earnings, it's really yeah. only four economic indicators, durable goods, yeah. the unemployment rate, rates, and commodity prices. Other than that, yeah. you don't necessarily need to track every indicator that's out orders. there. So, uh, yeah, well, I'm curious, though. I mean, and this may be a dumb question, but what's driving 
GDP, or rather what's driving stocks? Is it GDP or the economic conditions yeah. driving the equity market, or is the equity market kind of to a certain extent yeah. driving what we end up seeing in economic conditions? It's probably neither. Okay. <laughs> you know, I, I don't think yeah. it's a one-to-one. -one. Yeah. I think we oftentimes yeah. over-attribute one to the other, and yeah. I think that's the big mistake that everyone makes yeah. is earnings are earnings, and it's a composite of, for the S&P 500, 500 different company earnings at any, any given yeah. time. There's almost about... no correlation between GDP and S&P 500 earnings. I can tell you that with great certainty. Oh, right, yeah. Well, it that's... just is meaningless. Have you ever thought about moving on from the S&P 500? You'd be like, but what, yeah. did, what did Buffalo like? You like the Wilshire yeah. 3000 or something? Yeah, you know, this is why we use the Russell around, right? 2000, yeah. why in global stacks we use the yeah. Bloomberg World Index. We look oh, at I all the different index, indices. The yeah, so it's absolutely worth looking beyond. Yeah. Uh, but the S&P 500 is, you know, for better or for worse, the most often cited. Yeah index to represent yeah. the U.S. equity market. Well, it's better than citing the Dow. Well, we're certainly to blame for yeah. some of that. So as we look ahead to earnings, because Carol Masser reminded us, earnings season is not that far away. Yes. Um, what will you be look? What will be the better read for the overall condition of yeah. the U.S. economy? These big cap stocks that will be reporting in the first couple of weeks yeah. or the consumer companies that come later on and really showcase the level of spending that has dropped off or kind of wavered? Yeah. Uh, what I think is most important to watch in the S&P 500 is the 493. It's not consumer stocks specifically. It's not the MAG-7 specifically. It's not even financials by themselves. It's mm -hmm. the 493 as a composite because this will be the first quarter supposedly, according to consensus, the fourth quarter is the first quarter since early 2022 in which the 493 actually produced earnings growth. So we should see a broadening earnings story start to emerge with the fourth quarter earnings season. It's incredibly important to the durability of the equity market, as well as sort of popular perceptions about the economy, that that continues to gather momentum through 2024. All right, Gina, always great to talk to you. You have to go down to your team and find like some catchy name for those 493 yeah. stocks. Uh, I, don't, I don't know. That's going to be a little bit of a task. Gina Martin Adams. The rest our, of them. How she's about our, that? She's <laughs> our chief equity strategist over at Bloomberg Intelligence. Stick with us. A lot more coming Coming up on the show, including a closer look at Apple in the 2024, uh, off to a rough start for the company as more analysts turn bearish. We're going to talk about that after the break. This is Bloomberg. All right, Apple shares coming off their best year in about three years, up 50% in 2023, giving back about 3.5% here on the first trading day of the year. And that's largely on the back of a downgrade over at Barclays, cutting the company to sell, raising some concerns here about demand for the iPhones. Mark Kerman joining us right now, who covers this for us here at Bloomberg. And I'm sure you saw the report. Apparently, this analyst not all that enthused about the iPhone 15, and he thinks that whatever we get out of the iPhone 16 isn't going to move the needle either. Are you buying that? Yeah, so Barclays is pointing out some holes in, in Apple's business, uh, certainly uh, calling out the iPhone 15, saying that its performance is uh, you know, coming in below expectations. I think we need to sort of wait and see what Apple says in terms of the numbers. Uh, in terms of the iPhone 16, I think the iPhone 16 is going to be an important upgrade. This is going to be when Apple increases the screen size yet again of the iPhone, they're gonna be going from 6.1 inch to 6.3 inch on the 16 Pro. And then on the bigger phone, they're going to be going from 6.7 inch to 6.9 inch. Now that may not uh, mean much Wait, so or sound like the actual phone like gets much. bigger? Where the, we're the displays will get bigger. The, the screens will get bigger on the phones. And the phone hardware itself will get marginally bigger. You won't be able to really tell much. Uh, but you'll see the displays get a little bit bigger. And I think personally, even if they're not changing much else, on the phone, which they're not, there's a few other bells and whistles we can get into. I think a bigger screen size will actually sell and be compelling in some markets, uh, including in China. Certainly for me personally, uh, I think bigger is better. And I think there's gonna be a lot of people clamoring to upgrade if they haven't upgraded in a few years to that bigger screen size. And I will say, even in years where the iPhone doesn't get a, a big revamp, a big redesign, you saw that with the iPhone 13 Pro, you saw that with the iPhone 14 Pro, uh, they still do, you know, pretty well, I will say. But I think this year is really more about the iPad. It's a more about AirPods, uh, more about the, the, the Mac uh, than the iPhone per se. As I wrote a couple weeks ago, the iPhone 
despite bringing in more than half of their revenue, is taking a little bit of a back seat okay. uh, while Apple tries to bring more of their other products to the forefront. Apple right. Watch is going to get a big upgrade in the fall, for instance. Okay, but the watch is facing some patent issues right now. And Tim Long of Barclays also talks about a lack of bounce back in products like Macs, iPads, and wearables. So what's really left here from Barclays' perspective in terms of the products that will deliver? Yeah, I mean, it's true. Their new product category, the Vision Pro, that's going to be released in the next 30 days or so. Uh, you shouldn't expect any material revenue coming from that product in the next year, maybe two years down the road. I think it's going to be quite compelling. Uh, the Apple Watch patent situation, that's going to be resolved in the next month or so, I, I would say. Uh, and so I don't think the long-term issue is anything other than if more companies come out and sue Apple for patent infringement, Certainly Mossimo, this was a one of one situation. No company has successfully gotten an Apple product off of store shelves before. So Mossimo has gone way further than any other company. And I would say it's gonna be difficult for Lightning to strike twice uh, on that one, but mm -hmm. we shall see. I'm not as pessimistic uh, as Barclays on the iPhone situation, but I will tell you there are things to be pessimistic about uh, on Apple right now. I don't like? think the iPhone is one of them. I think being behind uh, in AI uh, is certainly a risk there. They're going to make their AI introduction in about six months from now mm -hmm. in June, and that won't roll out until September, October. And even then, that will be the beginning of a stream of generative AI products. So there are several months, if not a couple of years, behind the competition there. Uh, certainly the App Store and the Digital Markets Act and antitrust scrutiny, that's another big one. That can certainly impact the yeah. bottom line on terms of services revenue. So I think the real story is not the iPhone, but it's elsewhere. Right, and well, services will definitely be a concern given it's a much higher margin than those products. Mark Gurman, thank you so much. Bloomberg's Mark Gurman, our go-to guy on all things Apple. Next up, we'll speak with Mike Mayo, head of U.S. Large Cap Bank Research at Wells Fargo on City. A bit of an everything sell-off in U.S. markets today. You saw that on a price basis in treasuries. You saw that in commodities, and you certainly saw it in equities. The S&P 500 ending the day down by about six-tenths of a percent. But the broader sell-off was actually in that big cap tech space with the NASDAQ 100, as well as the composite, down about 1.6%, 1.7% here on the day. Chip stocks took it on the chin by the most, down about 4% here. But there were a few bright spots out there. You did actually see a bid come into the crypto space. That's on the back of that big rise that we saw in Bitcoin above that 45,000 level. And you saw a pretty interesting bid come into some of the financial stocks, particularly some of those big banks with J.P. Morgan closing a little bit earlier today at a record high. Scarlett. There was also a bid coming into Tesla today because it was the only, actually, no, I take that back. It finished little change. At one point, it was the only one of the Magnificent Seven that didn't decline. But this comes on the heels of Tesla delivering more vehicles than expected in the fourth quarter, just not enough to stay ahead of China's BYD when it comes to global electric car sales. So let's discuss the outlook for electric vehicles with Mizuho senior analyst Vijay Rakesh. Uh, Vijay, Tesla and other EV other automakers, for that matter, face challenges with production, with pricing power. Um, there's also subsidy cuts. The outlook for EVs for 2024, therefore, does face some challenges that it didn't really face in 2023, doesn't it? It does, Scarlett, and thanks for having me on. I think if you look at the EV space in 2024, we think what you're seeing is multiple headwinds, uh, especially given some subsidy cuts in the U.S. Uh, with, uh, with uh, restrictions in China. Uh, components in the cars, so both the marquee and the Model 3 could be impacted, and so also the Cybertruck. Uh, but also, as you look at uh, Europe, you have Germany stopping all subsidies starting January 1st. Uh, that's one. But then you are also on the production side, you have Ford cutting production of the F-150 by almost 50% for 2024, and push-outs on Volkswagen, CV factory, etc. So globally, you're seeing at least uh, North America and Europe uh, kind of slow down, pump the brakes a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, but on the flip side, I think China continues to be strong. So, Well, a lot of this was anticipated. We saw Tesla and Ford engage in some price cutting, price war uh, on electric vehicles. Will more price cuts, at least in the U.S., VJ, stoke sales? We think uh, it'll be more challenging to cut sales into 2024. Some of the 2023 uh, price cuts were enabled by the subsidies that were flowing through the system. Uh, in 2024, given that some of the subsidies sunset, 
it becomes tougher for the EV guys to continue to cut pricing. Um, you know, if you look at Tesla, they have cut pricing substantially. Their pricing is down 20 to 40 percent from the peak. So I think they have cut pricing. You know, going in 24, you have the subsidy falling off, being a little bit of a headwind. There's probably a little bit of room, but nothing compared to, not not a lot compared to 2023, I should say. Talk to us a little bit about the cost side of this, because and, and sort of baked into those price cuts was this sort of longer term promise that obviously the cost of production, the cost of batteries, everything else would come down meaningfully over time. And I know to a certain extent we've seen that with Tesla, but some of the commentary we got uh, in 2023 out of Ford, out of GM, seem to suggest not only are those costs not going down, but in some cases they went up. That, that's correct, I think, Robin. Uh, that's a good question. I think as you look at uh, the battery side, costs are definitely coming down, but it's a cash into cash into situation. I think for costs to come down, you need scale. Uh, and for scale, you need, you know, you need production. So, but you cannot produce if you're not making good profit on it. So it's, you know, what comes first, the chicken or the egg, right? So I think that's a real problem. And so, but uh, for somebody like Tesla, they are having, they have scale, their costs are coming down. GM has talked about the Ultium platform uh, with their battery costs coming down 50% with the new platform. So there are, there is, there are some bright spots on the battery side, but definitely it's uh, still, getting the production to scale um, to kind of, uh, you know, drive those costs down the battery side. So. Is, is sourcing material still an issue? I, I Obviously, Elon Musk has been very vocal about some of the issues that uh, Tesla had to go through. And, and again, once again, we did hear similar commentary uh, out of folks like uh, Jim Farley and uh, Mary Barra as well. Yeah, I think uh, some of the prices on lithium, et cetera, have come down. Uh, but, you know, I think it's still uh, battery production capacity is still fairly limited. Um, and so it's still a tight situation out there. Plus, uh, you have the whole cost uh, factor in this as well. So, uh, so I think there's multiple uh, facets to that equation. So, it's, but the component side costs are definitely coming in. It's definitely a tailwind into 24-25. Vijay, always a pleasure to talk to you. Happy New Year, and we'll talk again soon, I'm sure. sure. Vijay Rakesh, senior analyst there, uh, talking a little bit here about what we're seeing in the EV space as some of those numbers out of Tesla and Rivian start to trickle in, delivery numbers here that in some cases coming in a little bit lighter than what the street was looking for. All right, let's turn from the EV space to banking stocks. They actually had a really good day today. In fact, J.P. Morgan closed at a record high, but our next guest says J.P. Morgan's not his favorite stock for 2024. That would be Citigroup. Mike Mayo joining us right now, doubling down on his bullish call for Citigroup, expecting the shares to double over the next three years. Mike, great to have you here. And I, I think it's an interesting call because I feel like Citigroup for so long has really been the laggard, at least among the big uh, banks here in the U.S. here. What's changed? And I assume it might revolve around a certain CEO. Well, I would say you know, J.P. Morgan was my top bank pick for last year, mm -hmm. uh, and this is a pivot. And that was a good call. And But now yeah. let's yeah. go to Citigroup as okay. my top three picks for 2024 are Citigroup, Citigroup, and Citigroup. Oh. Okay, all right. And you could either consider Citigroup a three-ring circus, or you could view it as three connecting circles, like a three-circle Venn diagram. And I choose the latter. The first circle is their org simplification, uh -huh. their delayering management from 13 layers, 13, yeah. you know, from the bottom to the top CEO down right. to eight. Uh -huh. They're eliminating uh, two intercompany uh, lines of business. Mm -hmm. uh, they are organizing along five lines of business, and that's it. Mm -hmm. You know, do away with so much matrix management. That's right. That's kind of ring number one. Ring number two would be their transformation, where they're finally modernizing their back office technology. And some of this yeah. is regulatory driven, but it's stuff that other banks are doing. Right. And the third ring are these business exits. They're retreating from 14, nine U.S. consumer markets and some other businesses. So you take yeah. these three circles together right. and you have the bi biggest restructuring at Citigroup in modern history. So the question is, does it turn out good yeah. or bad? And I'm saying it turns out well enough for this stock to double over the next three years. Well, that's what I want to talk about, because, I mean, we kind of know what Jane Frazier has been trying to do. This is going to be, a, I guess, to a somewhat slimmed down company, or at least slimmer than what it was here. Does that automatically translate into better profitability? I think the bottom line is that Citigroup is becoming a much more simple and profitable firm whose earnings should double over the next three years. But this is make or break time for Jane Frazier. You said, mm -hmm. is this due to Jane Frazier? Mm -hmm. Maybe. Mm. I think so. Yeah. But not definitely. I mean, to some degree, the feedback from investors has been for the last you know, year, Citigroup's blown up 
the profit and loss statement due to expenses that are out of control. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My view is they're ripping the guts out of the company, reconstructing it, and that costs money, but those expenses then start going down. And they've already guided expenses to go lower in 2024 and for 2025. So I think this is a combination of a much more optimized, streamlined, efficient firm who's that and that'll drive returns much higher. That should drive yep. the stock price higher. Now, we have several scenarios in my 50-page report. Mm -hmm. If there's a recession, yeah. I think Citigroup stock underperforms because they have right. a lot more credit cards. They're top three yeah. in that. But outside a recession, we think the stock doubles. Yeah. And a bull scenario, I think Citigroup stock triples over the next three to four years. Okay, so this isn't even the most optimistic scenario. This is like, you know, if they get most of what they promise done, done, then the stock can double. What about the fact that Lots of CEOs at Citigroup have tried to embark on reorganizations and haven't totally executed. I mean, history is not on Citi's side. Well, you can read Exile on Wall Street. Um, <laughs> that, that's by me. Um, thank you for writing about it when I published it. And so, mm -hmm. yeah, I wrote two of the ten chapters about the failures of Citigroup. So right. I understand Citigroup's mistakes. But what's different this time uh -huh. is the result of this restructuring should be a much more simple city group, not a more complex city group. And that's night and day different than before. I do think they'll have uh, a big reduction in headcount. In fact, city groups revenue per employee is one fourth worse than the average bank. So they have too many employees. They should at least, you know, reallocate those resources. But what I really love about the new simplicity of city group, it's five business lines. I mean, so you have services, which is the payments business, mm -hmm. 95 countries around the world. You have banking. You have markets. That's 60% of the company. Then the other 40% is consumer-oriented, U.S. personal banking, and global wealth. And that's it. Very clear, like a normal company for the first time that I've looked at this company Why in my fourth decade. Why hasn't anyone else done this? Why hasn't this been done before, if this is so simple, if this is so clear? It's definitely not simple. It's definitely not so clear. But sometimes it's, it's elegant in its simplicity that mm. you're finally ripping out the guts and disconnecting pieces and reconfiguring pieces. That's really hard, multi-year work. So now they're at year, I mean, they had their 2021 investor day three years later. And they're at that stage where they've just sold most of their non-U.S. consumer so that they can dismantle that global consumer infrastructure that's been in place for decades. Is this going to be a much more U.S. sort of focused company or North American focused company? I think that's the wrong question. Okay. What? What's the right question? <laughs> no, because look, since, you know, I'm thinking back, I, was, I worked at the Fed in 1988, 99, 1991, they almost failed. You had the uh, uh, Middle East money come in to yeah. help save Citigroup. Uh, you had heads of different regions. Yeah. The right question is, how are the line of businesses lined up? See, that's the difference. We right. always talk, you know, regions and how's Latin America doing and how's Europe doing and yeah. how's Asia doing. No, how are these five business lines doing? That's the new way to think about Citigroup. And some of these lines of businesses, uh, well, four of the five are global, right? Uh, except for you know U.S. personal banking, which is probably you know U.S. Okay. Yeah. So I, it's not so much are we investing outside the U.S. or not. It's like, is this business line investing? So certainly the services business, right. which is payments, 95 countries, they move like four trillion dollars of money a day. They're the largest wholesale payment processor in the world. That's one fourth of the company. I estimate the value of that one business line yeah. almost equals Citigroup's entire market cap. So right. buy, well, but, buy, but, buy, but buy, buy, a, let me finish this because it yeah, took ahead. a lot of work for this one conclusion. I, Mike, you're getting riled up here. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm yeah. riled right. up now. Yeah. Buy one business line yeah. and get the other four business lines almost for free. Well, well, that's what I'm talking about because the business line you're talking about, that's the business line that they shouldn't fail at. That's the, that, that to me seems like the easiest one for her uh, to deal with. When I hear about wealth management and you look at how they are lagging some of their competitors as well as some of the other business units or these new the new five business units that they end up with here how do they catch up with Morgan Stanley and wealth manager or with JP Morgan on the investment banking side I'm not defending their expansion in wealth one iota I think okay. it's a fantastic a fantasy trip down the wealth management expansion lane really? Yeah, I'm oh. not buying into that. I haven't seen evidence. Andy C. But, came but over. that seems like the holy grail for all these banks. Everyone just talks about wealth management, wealth management. Okay, so you know, yeah. ten percent of the, yeah. the the pro forma company. Okay, waits to be seen. Having said that, uh -huh. they are relatively stronger in Asia and non-U.S. parts. Uh -huh. So we'll wait and see. They have new hand. Andy C. came from Bank of America, but that's ten percent. Yeah. Okay, and then we talk about cards and you know, U.S. personal banking. 
You add that in there, that's 40% of the company. It's not falling off a cliff or anything, but mm -hmm. that's 40%. Yeah. But the other 60%, you're looking at increasing market share with 5,000 multinational firms yeah. in payments, banking, and markets. Yeah. That's very understandable, quantifiable, and an enormous yeah. moat versus competitors. Yeah. Is the glass 60% full or 40% empty? And I'm not even conceding the other 40% is empty. All right, Mike Mayo, thank you so much. We've got to leave it there. Mike Mayo, a very fired up Mike Mayo with his call on Citigroup. Uh, I wouldn't season ask him more doubling. about cards. <laughs> I don't know. Do people get Citibank cards? I feel like it's I Chase, think people do. Yeah, no, they definitely do. Okay. Mike is head of U.S. Large Cap Bank Research at Wells Fargo. There is some breaking news here on the political front, and, of course, this is something our colleagues at uh, Balance of Power will continue to cover. According to the Associated Press, uh, Trump, Donald Trump, is appealing the main ballot decision that bars him. So he is appealing the main ballot decision to the state superior court, of course, that bars him from appearing on the primary ballot. We will continue to follow that development for you as uh, more headlines cross. But in the meantime, we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, Harvard University's president stepping down after allegations of plagiarism and concerns over campus policy. We'll discuss uh, the resignation of Claudine Gay. This is The Close. The most read story on the Bloomberg Terminal over the last eight hours is Claudine Gay stepping down as president of Harvard University. She ends a brief and tumultuous tenure with allegations of plagiarism and an ongoing campus controversy over anti-Semitism still raging. Bloomberg Opinion's Alison Schrager joins us now to discuss this. What do you think ultimately did her in? Was it her handling of tensions on campus or the just ongoing plagiarism allegations that just kept coming up and up? I think it was just the combination of all of them. I mean, maybe one plagiarism issue on its own, especially because it's a literature review, or maybe she probably could have survived, like Sally Poom Booth is probably going to survive at MIT, the, her testimony before Congress. But I think just all of them together, it just became too much to the point where she just really couldn't leave the institution anymore. It raises the question, though, as to, I guess, A, who replaces her permanently. Mm -hmm. I know they have to, to do a search here. But whether that new leader is going to run into some of the same issues. I mean, set aside the plagiarism stuff, obviously, mm -hmm. that was very specific to her. And we should point out Harvard, I guess, did their own investigation yeah. and found no wrongdoing. And I mm -hmm. think we should make, make that very clear here. But in terms of dealing with the student body, dealing with these free speech issues here, how are they going to, how is a new person going to be able to navigate that? Well, I think it depends on the role, on the view Harvard wants to take. I mean, I think one of the reasons the anti-Semitism stuff rubbed people the wrong way, I mean, she, she did make, a, I think, a reasonable and defendable um, sort of argument for free speech. The problem was that Harvard didn't seem to be defending free speech. And honestly, this is before her tenure, in all fairness. Mm -hmm. Before that, so it struck people as very hypocritical or sort of they had two different standards depending on who was being discriminated against. So it depends on what the view they want to take forward. If they want to say someone who's just like, hey, we are for free speech and we've made some mistakes in the past, but we're going this way. Or to say, hey, you know, we're in an environment where everyone, you know, never is going to be offended, then we're going to go with that way. I think they just need someone who's just going to say, this is our vision going forward, and we're going to stick with it. Yeah, you're referring to Harvard not um, renewing the deanship of a law professor, for instance, who worked on Harvey Weinstein's legal defense mm -hmm. or canceling a course on police tactics after some students petitioned to nix it. You talk about how uh, there, there needs to be a leader who kind of just defines a vision. Is that the job of the president or the board of Harvard, well, the, the Harvard Corporation? Well, I mean, really both, because, I mean, the president is the public figure. I mean, so they embody this. I, I read an interesting quote from Larry Summers about when he stepped down about the math controversy. And he said, you know, I still stand behind what I said, which was, he thinks, largely misinterpreted. But he's like, my job as president of that university is not to say things that get into that much trouble or could be easily misinterpreted. It's a very difficult, I mean, it's the reason why it's such a prestigious and well-paid job. It's a hard job where you do have to represent this institution that is so much in the public eye. And I think that's what I find confusing because when you look at the comments that she made at that hearing, mm -hmm. as well as uh, her two colleagues who are sitting next to her, I mean, it read like, okay, how do we appeal to everyone mm -hmm. without offending anyone? And I'm sure those statements got lawyered to death here. And maybe they should have just spoken from the heart. But I guess where's the balance? I mean, how do you sort of uh, draw, uh, toe that line? 
Well, I think that's why yeah. it's a hard job. And I think yeah. particularly, these, these are contentious times. Yeah. And maybe they do need someone who can have a little bit more moral leadership. Yeah. As I said, and she could have said, hey, we've made mistakes in the past. I mean, probably legally she shouldn't have, but I mean, that I think people would have said, but you know what, this is our policy going forward. And you know what, a lot of those mistakes happened when I wasn't president. Mm -hmm. I think people would have understood that. It was just the sort of strange double speak and the heartlessness, I think, threw people off. And then you layer on the plagiarism. And it just became clear she couldn't lead the institution anymore. So University of Chicago has a very particular stance when it comes to speech issues or how the university represents itself, right? It stays neutral and stays mum on matters that don't directly affect it. Do, do alumni or do donors get mad at University of Chicago for not saying anything, for not jumping out and making a statement every time something happens? I mean, not that I'm aware of, um, but I think it's because they don't, they don't look and have that expectation. I'm actually president of the board for my university. Um, I don't have any control over what they do. I mm -hmm. just advise them. And, you know, I, I didn't have an issue with what they, I don't think they said anything about Israel, but they don't, they don't, they don't take political stances mm -hmm. on these issues. So I didn't really expect them to. So I think the people are just looking for consistency. And as I said, there's definitely universities of late have seemed particularly political and not really open-minded to sort of different political points of view. So I think this is why this has just rubbed everyone the wrong way. But I think it's good, they can turn it around. Or I think even, I'm actually, my optimistic take on this is, yeah, like Ivy League universities look a lot less compelling lately to people, but maybe that's what we need. I mean, I mm. think there's too much of a premium on people going to one of like 15 schools, and I don't think that's healthy for the country. I mean, there's a lot of really talented students at all sorts of schools all over the country, and maybe employers should look more, we should put less of a premium on where people go to school anyway. But that gets to this idea, though. I mean, are those schools really facing any sort of a different issue than, I guess, what we saw from Harvard, MIT, mm -hmm. and et cetera, et cetera, and the Ivies here? I mean, this issue of being able to express yourself and, at the same time, the university's obligation to protect students and mm -hmm. keep them out of uh, harm's way here, I mean, that's nothing specific to Ivy Leagues, is it? Well, I think because there's become yeah. such a big premium on you have to go to Harvard and this is like the intellectual leadership of the country and these are the people who are we're training to like be the best people in the country, which is ridiculous. You should have leaders coming from all sorts of places that what goes on there all of a sudden becomes a big issue. I mean, we haven't heard anything about what happened at Texas A&M, you know, also great school. I think that's the highest but doesn't get doesn't cost the same amount as Harvard either so that's another part of it exactly but also a great education but like people don't have the same expectation or sort of kill themselves to the same extent to to go there mm -hmm. so I mean I think in some ways this is what makes it such a hard job is people sort of have unrealistic expectations of these universities would you take the Harvard job me personally yeah yeah, I'd give it a shot. But I, I'm sure I'd be fired in a year, too. But I mean... <laughs> yeah, just make sure you work out a nice severance package in advance there, just in case. Uh, Allison, always great to talk to you great and get your perspective. Thing. Allison Schrager, of course, is an opinion columnist for us here at Bloomberg. A closer look here uh, at the resignation of Claudine Gay over at Harvard University. All right, stick with us. We're going to get back to markets and set you up for what those markets will have their eye on tomorrow. This is Bloomberg. All right, let's set you up for what markets will have their eye on over the next 24 hours. A closer look at auto sales. Expected to get some of those monthly and quarterly numbers all day tomorrow. Yeah, that'll happen all day tomorrow. We already heard from Tesla selling more vehicles than expected uh, in the last quarter. Richmond Fed President Tom Barkin expected to speak, and we are going to get some economic data, particularly in the labor market. Yep, and of course, that's a lead up to the jobs report. And then, of course, James Gorman, the outgoing CEO of Morgan Stanley, will be speaking with us at 1030. Yeah, 1030 a.m. right here uh, on Bloomberg Television. And we'll also have coverage of the Fed minutes which will drop around 2 p.m. in the afternoon. All right, Scarlett and I will be back tomorrow. Thanks for watching us today. Balance of Power, that's coming up next here in the U.S. Have a great evening. This is Bloomberg.